Welcome to This Is Horror. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and I'm joined by my co-host, Bob Pastorella. How's it going, Bob? I'm doing pretty good, Michael. How are you doing? Oh, good, thank you. Very, very excited about this. This is our Halloween episode, and we'll be talking with Josh Malaman, who is the author of This Is Horror's Halloween novella release, A House at the Bottom of a Lake. So, pretty exciting stuff. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's going to be cool because everybody's going to be able to listen to the podcast and be able to get the book at the same time. So, that's a win-win. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And, I mean, here's an incentive. If you haven't pre-ordered A House at the Bottom of a Lake or if you haven't bought it, if you're now listening to it, and it's out. When you order it, within the first week, we send you the audiobook absolutely free. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so the audiobook is in production at the moment. As soon as it's ready, you get that. And yeah, free of charge. I mean, win win, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Win-win on Halloween Ween. There you go. Mm. So, but, uh, and, you know, it's funny you're giving it away for free. Uh, there's a lot of audiobooks out there for books, and they can get pretty pricey. So you get, like, a bonus here. This is pretty cool. Well, that's it. And, you know, this may be your only opportunity to get it for free. There you go. If you're looking for a deal, we have one for you. Yes, we do. <laughs> And, you know, the last time that the This Is Horror podcast spoke with Josh Malaman, it was Dan Hauer for night, and we spoke for, like, three hours. It was absolutely crazy, and I was in Japan at the time, as I am now, but I started recording at 11 p.m., so we weren't done till gone two a.m. And that was it was three hours, but that was an edited three hours. Exactly. <laughs> so you were actually on the air for probably three and a half, four hours. I know. Epic. We're gonna be back with him. So with that said, I believe that you have his bio. Yes, I do. Josh Mellerman is an American author, and he is the lead singer for the rock band The High Strum. He currently lives in Ferndale, Michigan. He first began writing while in the fifth grade, where he wrote about a space-traveling dog. Since then, he has written several unpublished novels, and his debut novel, Bird Box, was published in the United Kingdom and the United States in 2014 to much critical acclaim. He is also the author of Gassel and Yule, which is a Kindle single. He's featured in I Can Taste the Blood, Lost Signals, and, of course, our forthcoming A House at the Bottom of a Lake. And that is Josh Mellerman. And if you're listening to this as a patron, then we are just a day or so away from the release. And if you're listening to it when it comes out on Monday, you can buy it right now. So pause it and buy it and then come back and listen to the interview. Let's get him on the podcast. Let's do it. And now for a horror interview. Josh, welcome back to the This Is Horror podcast for the Halloween episode. How the hell are you doing? Oh, man. Uh, I am doing wonderful, and it is almost magical to hear your voice right now because of all that you and I have done together, you know, recently in terms of setting the book up and editing it and, and, and the, getting the cover art and all these exciting things, whatever. Um, and then to hear, be with you and talking in the flesh and you've been all over the world. And I guess I've been all over a bit too. And so, and Halloween is in a couple nights. So this is an especially exciting uh, night that we are meeting the three of us. Hello guys. I know it's incredible. And we are just days away from the release of a house at the bottom of a lake. It's been in the works for so long, and it is finally going to be in the listeners' hands and the readers' hands. It's incredible. 
Yeah, you know, last night I was saying to Allison, and I didn't even have to say any more than this, but I just said to her, I was like, can you imagine where I would be at psychologically if I didn't have a house at the bottom of a lake coming out in two days? <laughs> I, didn't have to, I didn't have to say any more than that. And she right. was like, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, on the subject to Halloween, let's just begin with, what is it that you typically do for Halloween and what does the festival, what does the occasion mean to you? Well, I had one particularly, um, well, two actually, but one really fantastic Halloween because um, it was, I had begun the rough draft of Bird Box on uh, whatever, it was an October 5th of that year, whatever year it was, and without planning to, had finished it on Halloween. And that night hosted a Halloween party at my house. Well, it was like the third floor of a house that I rented. So that, it will always be hard for me to top that one in terms of, you know, I didn't even plan on finishing this novel. And then I'm later that night, you know, in the morning I finished the novel. Later later that night I'm with all my friends and bandmates and we're all drunk. And, and this one girl, you know, uh, says, hey, congratulations, Josh, finished writing a rough draft today. And so whenever Halloween comes around, I always think of Bird Box for that reason. And then also last year, my friend James and I began a challenge, like a writing challenge in, I can't remember what, what it was, but, but we had to write essentially five rough drafts in five months. And I realized that sounds insane and who, why rush art and all those, all those arguments. I get it. But we were like, let's try it. Let's write five rough drafts for five novels in five months and end it on Halloween. And last year we did that. And on Halloween, we both ended our fifth and final draft. So Halloween for me has, has bizarrely turned into a, a deadline, but like an exciting one. Yeah. Like, if you can finish this book by Halloween, well, what a day to finish a scary book, right? So, so it's become something of that, you know. You know, some people will say to me around town, like, "Oh, you and uh, you and Allison, you guys probably don't do anything different on Halloween. You're reading scary books, and she's painting herself in some crazy, you know, awesome fashion, and so you guys are Halloween all year, and and we are, but at the, but we're also looking around town for parties right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every day is Halloween. Yeah, to guys like us, you know, and, and we see that online. You know, we see other people post that, like, well, you know, this I'm like this all year. And, you know, it's, it's kind of true. But but also, I'm not, you know, I embrace the holidays for the most part. Like, whatever. If everyone's out having fun, let's, let's have fun, yeah. And I would love to scare the hell out of some little kids. I would love to pretend to be <laughs> like a... I would love to pretend to be like a dead body on the front porch or, or pretend to be like a dummy or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be and good. Traumatize the, the kids in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Allison and I could definitely do that. <laughs> I mean, so this is now three Halloweens in a row where you've had a significant achievement in terms of writing, in terms of fiction, and in terms of horror. So I think, you know, now that you've made it three in a row, it's probably going to continue. I mean, you, you yeah. don't want to break the streak. Yeah, you have given me the third one. Yeah, it, it's it, it's it's incredible, man. I can't. Oh my gosh, I can't. You know, not not to get all too emotional, but when I saw a House of, at the Bottom of a Lake on Amazon, and and really, you know, the moment for me where where things really took off was when we got that cover art. Mm. That was the moment where I was like, wow, th this is this is really something else. And and then you know, I was going to give the story my all either way, but that. That up the ante some, on somehow for, on all fronts. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. And do you have a physical copy of Ray Cluley's Water for Drowning? No, because that's a this is horror novella, and that was another cover from Piper. And I kind of think that Water for Drowning and a house at the bottom of a lake could almost be like taken from the same thing because he's used those just gorgeous turquoise blue and green colors and i was only asking because if you saw that kind of physically in the flesh as it were you'll just see how in person those greens and turquoises are almost oh, even yeah. more vibrant they pop off the cover so it's gonna be a thrill when you get to hold it and look at that 
You know, one of one of the things that I love about that cover, you know, I wrote him, I wrote Pi saying, "Hey, I just wanted you to know that the the handrails on the stairs leading to the house, I, I think, are the most sort of exceptional part of this cover." And he wrote me back like, "Oh, thanks. I, I was really proud of that part." Yeah. And and if you look at that, it really is sort of astonishing work right there. And then <clears throat> um, one one thing that I think that the cover does is just it, it has the same amount of like fairy tale to it that the novella does and what i mean by that is there's only so much fairy tale to the novella but there is a dollop of it and i think that the cover also has just a just a, a slash of it and and it's it's definitely if i just saw that cover i'd be like oh this is a scary story for sure but it has like just a hint of that fairy tale and which is the same thing with the story and i I'm, I'm, I love that. Rather than the story being really dark and the cover being a total fairy tale, that kind of thing, they really seem to match up in that way. Yeah, and I think fairy tale is absolutely on point because it does have that magical quality to it throughout the tale. I mean, the house is magical, the lake is magical, love is magical. It's all there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I, th I think that if there's like a duality to it, to the idea of a fairy tale, because I think us as horror readers, you know, if you heard like, oh, hey man, you got to see this movie, it's really scary, and then that was followed up with, it's kind of like a fairy tale, you might be like, oh, yeah, man, fairy tale, fairy tale's not scary. But then at the same time, when we go and read fairy tales, those are, we, we're never as turned on as we are then, because they're, most of them are legitimately scary, and most of them are these brilliant original ideas, very strange ideas. So there's a strange duality of wanting and not wanting the fairy tale. You know what I mean? Yeah, and especially when you go back to the origins of the fairy tale and you look at the Brothers Grimm, for example, I mean, those fairy tales are not fairy tales in perhaps the way we might imagine the traditional child's fairy tale. I mean, there's magic, but... There's also some really brutal, messed up stuff. <laughs> really? Totally. I know. If my mom had read that sort of stuff to me as a kid, I might have, yeah. I might have had to, like, never had my own bedroom. I would have just, like, built, like, a, a bunk bed in her room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my grandparents used to have, like, this encyclopedia set, and it came with this books of fiction. And they had the Brothers Grimm in there. And this is this is probably 30, 40 years ago. I remember reading them as a kid. And I think that that probably had a little bit to shape, you know, my love of horror. So, and there's a new translation out. I can't find it, but I want to get it because they say that this translation is probably about as close to what they were really trying to accomplish than anything else. Oh, man. And so it's going to, you know... And it, it someone's. I was reading like a blurb, and I can't remember who wrote it, but said these tales are truly horrifying. And I'm like, I need to read those again. Yeah, yeah, same here. It, we it, when you discover what edition that is or whatever, will you let me know? Oh, I will. I will. I actually seen it in, in at Barnes and Noble, but uh, I was kind of in a hurry, so I need to go back and look at it. And I plan on going back next week anyway. So okay. I will probably look at it and pick it up and I'll take a picture of it and post it and tag you. So All right, sweet. Yeah, because I feel the same way. I think that I need to um and, and I've been doing this lately with with reading is you know, like actually dedicate a few weeks to like the Brothers Grimm. Like let's get to know them, Josh. You know, let's get to know them as an adult. Let's let's see what they were doing rather than just read one of theirs and move on to you know, a short story by Ray Garten or whatever. Let, let's 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 stay with Brothers Grimm for a couple of weeks. Let's stay with Ray Garten for a couple of weeks. Let's stay with Joyce Carol Oates. You know that kind of thing. I really and, and also trying to do that with periods too. Um, you know, hey, let's read a few novels from the '80s. Let's read a few not you know, like modern novels. And uh, I've been really trying to balance balance out. You know, it almost feels like, and you guys probably feel this way too, that you're constantly giving yourself a horror education. Mm. You know, as, it, as if you're like the teacher and, the, and it's like the greatest syllabus of all time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, <laughs> yeah. And I think what you're describing as well, it enables you to put the stories into context 
because even though there can be a certain joy from variety and picking and choosing and going from something radically different to something else that's completely on another scale, if you read, let's say, all of the books by Ryu Murakami in a row, it, it enables you to develop that context and to see not only yeah. what he's doing from story to story, but what what is his overall picture? What are the themes? What is he really getting at with his yep. fiction and how do they all fit together? Yeah, absolutely. And the same thing, that, that same thing happens with bands. And with bands, it's much, obviously, easier. You, you listen to one album and then you want to hear the next one, you know, and the next one. And then you, before you know it, in a couple days' time, you, you caught the entire growth of the kinks, you know? Yeah. And, and that's an awesome thing to to experience and it just it just takes a little more dedication with an author you know when i was much younger i mean maybe 22 or so i i went on a real like uh, william faulkner run where i read something like honestly like 19 of his books in a row or something it was really really intense and by the end of it by the end of it i i could not read another one it you know but i truly had a grasp on this on this artist this writer by the end of that run it's like once you get your fill of it, you have to change and do and cleanse the palate. I did the yep. same thing with Robert Aikman, and I was like, I have to read something that was written this year, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> yeah, all of this stuff was written like in the seventies, in the sixties, and the fifties, and it's incredible stuff. And you just immerse yourself in it, but then you you feel like that you're just like, oh my god, I got the whole breast of it, but I need to cleanse the palate. Yep, I could not agree more. I I even have to um do that with scary movies in general. And I wonder if all of us have to do that where sometimes I'm like, Whoa, Josh, man, you, you just watched like 10, like of the freakiest movies of all time, man. Why don't you just put on like a, you know, put on like a romantic comedy, you know, put, <laughs> put on like, like a cartoon for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. Got to cleanse the palate. Well, as it is Halloween, what, is the scariest movie or television show that you've watched this year? So it doesn't have to have been made this year, but just that you've personally watched. I, okay, I, you know, I experienced the, the divide on The Witch immediately upon seeing it. Okay, Al, Allison and I went and saw it at this, the theater, local theater here, and I was really, really scared to the point where I, man, you guys, did you guys see The Witch? I have, yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, yes. Okay, yeah. So there was one particular scene where I was like, I, I just can't take it, I can't take it. And I like hid my face in Allison's shoulder. And then I, when I pulled my face out, I was like, did I miss something? And she goes, well, yeah, they just showed The Witch. I was like, oh, come on, really? Did I just miss The Witch? And she was like, yeah, you, you like, that was, that was it. And I was like, come on, man, now, now I, gotta, I gotta watch it again, right? So I, I, I saw The Witch, and I don't know what The Witch looks like. And so after the movie, Alice and I stayed through the credits because I, I just couldn't, I couldn't get enough of that, just the whole experience. And I'm thinking, this is a masterpiece. Th th this is going to be like, you know, everyone's favorite horror movie ever. And there was a young couple seated near us in the theater, and I walked up to them, and they, stayed, they sat through the credits also. And I said, wow that one right and then the girl goes that was garbage <laughs> I, was, I was like what do you mean that was garbage and i was like what do you like and she goes i like it follows and i was like well yeah so do i and then we talked to them for a while and then later that night or later that week i saw online the there's a real divide on the witch there were people who thought like me were like so scared I know people that were like, oh, my gosh, this is like the cheesiest thing ever. And I was not expecting that with that one. But for me, that was kind of the scariest one. I, I would say this is, that's the scariest one I've seen this year. Yeah. Well, I think It Follows is definitely more palatable and easier to consume. Perhaps the problem that some people had with The Witch, from what I can ascertain, is just that it was quite a slow burn. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess as well, because so much of it is built up on the atmosphere, it could almost depend on where you watch it and what kind of mindset you're in. Because it's a film where 
you absolutely have to consume all of it. Like, you couldn't watch it passively and expect to get a lot out of it. You have to be all in when you're watching it. If you're all in, it's going to terrify you. But I guess if you just wanted more of a kind of armchair flick with some popcorn and laughing with friends, well, it's not going to do it for you. <laughs> But it yeah. follows wood. I mean, it follows. You could easily watch with some snacks and some friends and a few beers, and it would still be legitimately entertaining. That is a very interesting idea, because now I'm imagining a theater with, rather than 30 people in the theater, I'm, I'm imagining 30 moods. And yeah. what if you know, what if the next day, it would just like, which would be very likely, all thirty moods were 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 changed, were different. Like the thirty people felt were in a different state of mind. If the reaction would be split the opposite way, and and I wonder how many, you know, and and that's another reason, by the way, for rereading stuff like like the uh, Brothers Grimm and everything. Really, is is that it's like, you know, the things that you disliked that people liked, man, you just might have been in a funky mood that day. I mean, and it's it, and here you are for years saying, oh, I don't. I never liked Blade Runner, you know, and it's like, well, you know, maybe you just were in a funky mood, and, and so yeah, that that's an argument. But oh, you know what though, it seems like that divide is happening a lot with this sort of sort of newer. I, I don't know what to call it yet. I don't know if anyone knows what to call it yet. That sort of newer batch of like so, semi art house horror movies: Babadook, It Follows, The Witch, Good Night Mommy, um, Neon. Demon, there, there's a sort of there seems to be a real divide amongst all of those. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I, mean, oh, I know I mean, exactly where you're coming from. There's there's some that think it's it's highbrow and it, or horror should be fun and all this stuff and fuck that man. Horror can be whatever the fuck it wants to be. <laughs> if you don't like it, then don't watch it. If you do like it, then tell the world about it and share and everything like that. But yeah. horror, I mean, I read an article yesterday that was talking about, and they, they were talking about how other people think that horror needs to be fun. It, it can. It, it, that's part of it if you look at it like a big umbrella, but no, not necessarily. Yeah, but, but people no, like what they want to like. And I, I mean, I imagine you two feel this way also, and I definitely do, which is I love it all. I, I mean, meaning I love, you know, the craziest splatter madness to the quietest whisper of a horror film. I love all of it. And so... You know, I I think there are people, though, who do sort of, and it doesn't mean they're any more closed-minded necessarily, but that they do sort of stick their flag in the, you know, quiet horror camp because maybe it's more, um, what's the word, respectable or something. And then there are people who just, you know, stake their claim in the in the campy fun camp because to them horror is supposed to be gross-out madness. And, and I don't know, man, I love it all. I would love to write a novel or, or somehow a work of art that combined both of those somehow where there was, let's say one book where it was like two threads going on at once that were connected where one was a very, very steady, quiet, slow burn. And the other was just absolute like Richard Lehman madness. Yeah. And I would, I would love to, to have a book like that just to, oh, not to be so smarmy, but to sort of say like, Hey, look, they can live together under the same roof. Right. That'd be you fun. know, it's funny you say that. That reminds me of something, and I hate to give him any ideas, uh, because if you want to do this, I want you to run with it, and it really doesn't matter. But it, that kind of sounds like something that Stephen Graham Jones would do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he would sure. try to, like, I'm going to do the highbrow stuff, but I'm also mm -hmm. going to do this crazy theme that goes right through it. And uh, But you, I, you, I like that. You, you need to do that, Josh. So, so let's block him when we post about this podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me mad. I can't get the episode. He'll, he'll actually send me a message. What's wrong with the episode, man? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you mentioned Stephen Graham Jones because he actually messaged me saying he cannot wait to read A House at the Bottom of a Lake. He is so excited for it. Oh, man. Man, oh, man. That guy, huh? I, um... I read Mongrels and blurbed Mongrels um, about, was it about this time last year? My gosh, it might have been. And holy cow, you both read Mongrels, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that guy is just, I mean, he's, you know, there. I do 
recognize that we are in a a, 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 a golden era of horror fiction for sure. I mean, there are some just seriously brilliant novels and short stories, and every day it seems like another legitimately brilliant idea is is being put to paper. But you know, Stephen Graham Jones, there's there's just some magic dust there, you know. And I like to believe that a lot of us have that, but but he's he's definitely one of them. So certainly, everything he does it almost seems experimental or fresh even if it's revisiting old tropes i mean you you, you spoke about (laughs) mongrels but it's a werewolf story but at the same time it's a coming of age story it's a story about family politics it just it's infused with so much you know just looking at this i've seen a few people online that are saying this is the greatest werewolf novel ever written. Now, imagine before writing Mongrels, like if I was him, I would sit down and be like, okay, like, well, I have a werewolf story, but I don't know, man, there's so many werewolf stories. You know, I might say that to myself or something or blah, blah, blah. But then to write the story and some people say it's the best werewolf novel ever written, just even for some people to consider it that, I mean, you're operating at a, at a high level at that point. Right. I mean, that's just, there's a lot of there's many werewolf like stories and short stories and films and mongrels immediately jumps up to the top of that list and it's he's just he's got that dust yeah well he he did something with werewolves that hasn't been done usually in especially like if you look in an urban fantasy setting the werewolf's kind of like the redheaded stepchild sidekick uh, you know <clears throat> but whenever yeah. you have <laughs> The whole the whole coming of age type of story and put the character front and center by viewing it through the eyes of a teenager growing up. I think that that's something that's fresh, it's different, uh, and really, truly, I mean, I know that there's a lot of werewolf stuff out there, but there's not a lot of quality werewolf stuff out there, and that's that's a significant difference. Yeah, I think they, stack it up against vampires. There's a lot of quality vampire stuff out there, but there's a whole not a whole lot of quality uh, fiction when it comes to werewolves. Hey, you know what? I'm reading right now for the first time ever. I'm reading The Howling, and I'm uh I'm just over halfway through. Have you guys read The Howling, the original? Yes, I did. Like a long time ago. I need to read it again, and it, it it's a is good. So good. I I can't. I kind of like astonished at how good this is it's absolutely nothing like the movie like it's even strange that that movie called itself that except for that it's a great title and i heard that the howling four is the first time that the howling movies even sort of reference this book really in a bigger way and it really reminds me of richard matheson um and i read online someone had said it's richard matheson light but i i don't see it, i don't see it like that it's not it's it's nothing light it's just it reminds me of Richard Matheson because it's a real straight shot and it's and there's like a gentlemanly sort of grace behind it, even though there's some brutal moments, but there's a gentlemanliness to it and there's a there's a real real straight, like I don't want to say slow burn, but direct, steady like story to it. And that I was not expecting at all. I was expecting like the novelization of the movie, and it's absolutely nothing like that. So speaking of quality werewolf stuff, this is this is definitely one of those. Yeah, and you got to look. You got you know the the I think it's the last werewolf by uh what's the guy's uh, last his last name is Duncan. Is it Glenn uh, Duncan? Glenn Duncan. He has a whole series out there. I started reading that, and, and unfortunately, I couldn't get into it because it just had this. I don't know. It was well written. I'm not going to lie to you. It's just it had this James Bond feel to it that I just didn't like. Uh, and I was being extremely picky. I probably need to give it another go. Uh. I have uh, I have Red Moon by uh, Benjamin Percy. Never read it. I- I've had it on my Kindle for a year. It's collecting dust on my Kindle, uh, <laughs> but I need to read it because I mean Richard Thomas just you know he's he bows to that. He's like that is such a good book. You need to read it. And uh, and but you know the the one that always comes to mind to me that I loved reading and it's not really a werewolf story is Wolfen, but it's uh, it, it's kind of like a werewolf story. It's kind of, and it's, but it's not. It's it's really hard to explain if you've never read it uh, or even seen the movie, which is a pretty decent adaptation. Uh, but uh, it just kind of gives you a different, a different, I don't know, a different viewpoint. And then there's uh, 
what is it, The Night Walker by uh, Thomas uh, Tessier. And uh, it's basically uh, what I would call like a psychological werewolf, you know. You know That's my experience. I've never gone outside of that. I've seen other titles. Yeah, yeah. But it's kind of like you're going, eh, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. That is interesting. It's, it's like that that. That uh, subgenre or whatever was was more is more open than than maybe we all thought, and it maybe it took mongrels to kind of like alert us to that. I today I saw um, literally today in a bookstore, uh, my one of my favorite bookstores in town. The fellow that runs it, his name's Denny, and he's sort of my 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 go to guy for horror and sci fi. And you know, even when I'm on the road and I'm in another bookstore, I'll call Denny and be like, "Hey, what do you know about this?" And he 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 knows a lot about all that. And today. I saw an advanced reading copy of Wolfen there for three dollars. It's a red cover with black writing, and it's like it's presented from the by the publishing house in a way of like, we swear you're gonna love this book, you know. And I and and, and I was like, I didn't get it. I don't know why I didn't get it. Maybe I will tomorrow. But it's yeah. So it's that was cool for you to just bring that up because I was I had that in my hands today, an advanced reading copy. And I I decided not to get it for some reason. I don't know why, but now I will. Go back and get it. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> for three dollars, I mean, come on now. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, this is the thing. If you hear about something once, like you pick it up, you see it at a bookstore, you might let it slide. But then, if the same day someone yeah, mentions yeah, it, it's like, okay, <laughs> these are. Uh, the forces of the world aligning and telling me I need to get yeah. that book. For crying out loud, I spent like two hundred dollars like on a book about drunk ghosts, right? But this <laughs> one I couldn't spend three bucks on an advanced reading copy of Wolfen. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like I was at a used bookstore, I found a, a copy of uh the Gorman Gas trilogy, all in, in, in mass market paperback for five bucks. Oh yeah. And I set it on the counter. I come back home and I'm doing some things and get on Facebook and there's Paul Tremblay talking about Garment Gas. And I'm like, damn it. So I go back to the store the next day. It's gone. They don't have it. Oh. I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, I had it. I should have bought it. I had five bucks. It was like it was broke. Yeah, we should know better by now that when, when it's a find, it's a find, you know? And, and that's, I <laughs> yeah. mean, you know, especially when, I mean, how many bookstores you got in town, right? So you're always going to the same few. If there's something new there or something interesting, you're like, you got to grab that. Yeah, that's hilarious. Well, let's talk a little bit about a house at the bottom of a lake. Yes. So, I mean, first of all, I remember when we were talking about Bird Box, you said that you wrote it in that kind of mad 21-day binge or so. Of course, as you said, culminating at Halloween. I'm wondering, Mm -hmm. was the first draft of... A house at the bottom of a lake, a similar process. And, ha- yeah, what were the origins of that story? With house at the bottom of a lake, I can't remember where. Oh, no. I was working. Okay. I have um, a novel coming out in May, like the second full length, length novel with um, Harper Collins. And I was working on that book during the day. And then when the writing session was done, I would write like a thousand, I mean, like a thousand words a day. I- I- I've been trying. At, at, at pretty much with like John Skip's advice that I've been reading online, I've been trying to avoid the concrete word count thing recently. Mm. I, I feel like he's right when he says that people are, are sticking a little too much to word counts. But I was doing um, about a thousand, it was about a thousand words a day. And I think the first draft, what was it? Like, do you remember like 30,000 something? Yeah, I, yeah, I think it was a little bit less. It might have been oh, yeah, 25, right. 27,000. And then. Yeah, we and then it got a little bigger. Yeah, I love when the book gets bigger and not smaller. I love right, it. Right, right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so yeah, so while working on that other book, I was like, oh, here's a thousand words, you know, and then here's another thousand, and that I'll tell you, that's a, it's a really great way to, to work on a story that you don't really have, you know, not that you don't totally know what you're gonna do with yet, because. You know, a week goes by, you got 7,000 words. Two weeks, you got like 14,000. I mean, you're starting to have like a real a real story here. And 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 it's done in a more, a less pressurized way. It, it's not your quote unquote day's work. It's more like you already did your day's work and now you're like just loose and having fun. And so, 
So at some point with that one, I'm going to guess the rough draft must have taken, because at some point I, I doubled that up because I started to have a lot of fun with it. So if it was 27,000, I'm going to probably say it took, yeah, about 19, 20 days for the rough draft. Yeah. I mean, I think what you said with that answer there as well is a reply to anyone who says, oh, I don't feel that I have time to write. Now, it may it may be that it is someone who is juggling a lot of different things. They've got a full-time job. They've got things they need to do around the house. Perhaps they're a parent as well. But if you can somehow find a snatch of time to write around a thousand words per day, that, that really does add up quickly. I mean, those incremental gains and within... Within a month, you've got a novella. Yep, yep. And and like Bob was saying a moment ago, you know, some you, you turn around and six months pass. Well, all right. Well, what if in those six months you were you did this little bit every day? My God, you you could have, you know, a number of of stories going at once. You know, without putting uh, or dedicating that much time to it, which obviously that's not the best advice, right? You don't want to say like, hey, man, here's the easiest way to write. You know, here's the least <laughs> amount of time you have to spend on it, you know? Right. But, but at the same time, you know, there are, you know, I got a buddy who's like teaching and, and, and another one with kids and, and all these, and, and they're like, oh, it's hard to find time. But it, 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 it treat it like, if, if you treat it sort of like, you know, someone that works out every day. Like they spend an hour at the gym or they jog for a half hour. Same thing. And in the same way that you, you know, six months go by and you, you've got something going. Something like fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And it may, it may be hard to find time, but I truly believe if you want it, you'll find it. And oh, I, yeah. I mean, I've, I've said this before. You can't have everything, but you can have anything you want. It's all about that prioritization. How bad do you want it? If you want something else more, that's fine. That's okay. Yep. yep, Allison and I got rid of our TV for this very reason. It is true. Because it was like, okay, well, oh, there's no time. But, well, you had time to watch that, that Matthew McConaughey movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, all right, all right, let's get rid of the TV. <laughs> it, it sounds like the process for a house at the bottom of a lake was a more organic one i mean did you have much of a plan going into it i mean what what did you know before you put a word down i i knew that um all, all i had was you know the idea of i liked i guess it, i don't know it's, it's really hard to say because it was it's almost like i could say i could give you the answer that i saw the cover of the book first which was two te teenagers in a canoe you know floating above the roof of a house below them. And just to have that like image, that was the first thing I was struck with. And it was like, oh, so, okay, what happened here? These two teens found, wow, like a house somehow, you know, sank or something. And then from there, when I, that, that's all I started with. Mm. And, and I knew I, I, I had to get them on the water somehow. So the opening line of the book, you know, that's the best first date I ever heard of. That's been the same opening line, you know, the whole time because I wanted to start with, like, I didn't want to build up to James asking her out. I wanted it to be like, boom, they're going on a date. Let's go, you know? And let, let's get to that moment, that, that, that visual or whatever, of them floating above that roof. I don't want to say as soon as possible, but let's get there pretty, let's get there pretty fast because I kind of want to know what's down there, you know? And then so that's, that's how it started. And then it became that, that rhythm of starting it that way, that sort of, you know, I... I the more writing and writing I do, I really start to believe that each book has like, it's almost like you hire a different drummer to play along with, you know? And the, and the drummer behind A House at the Bottom of a Lake was, was real steady to me, was real sort of like, like slow builds and whatever. And he would rest, you know, at the same times that Amelia and James rested. And then every now and then he would like, you know, hit a cymbal crash that neither of them were expecting. And that would, I don't want to ruin the story or uh, spoil anything. He would, but he would hit a crash and it'd be like, Oh, here's a scary part or whatever. There just seemed to be a real 
real live drummer behind the writing of that one. And and I think it started with that like that very first line. And I'm not saying the first line is so this or that, but it just got to the point so quickly without the buildup of, you know, James is watching this girl in town or something like that. It just got right to it. And then I think that drummer was, you know, the rhythm of the story from there stayed in that pocket the rest of the time. Yeah, I think the drummer analogy is a great one. And I think... There's also a strong case to argue that the story is in fact a song. And I mean, that makes a lot of sense with you being a musician. But just looking at the language, the fact that there's a lot of repetition for emphasis, you have lines that take up one paragraph to really draw attention to them. And there's a lot of symmetry as poetry in terms of the events that take place. Yeah. You could think of it as like a duet because it's, oh, it's written yeah. in a very omnipotent, om, omniscient viewpoint. And I wanted, you know, that kind of leads into what I, what I wanted to know. Was that like something that you planned on doing or just happened naturally? Uh, I see it more and more, but we don't really have a, a, a set you know, head that we're in, that we're following the story. We can kind of, you, you, you move around and you do it so fluidly and so loosely. And it's just, it's like an ebb and flow. But when you said the drum and I started thinking, man, there's something about it. And then it, it hit me, bam, it's a duet. Yeah, that's cool, man. I, I like that idea a lot. And also, you know, I, okay. Like I remember with writing bird box at some point, I was like, wow, Mallory is in every scene in this book. And then I was like, wait, can I have a scene without her? Like, what would happen now if I if I had a scene without her? I was almost like afraid to leave her. Like that the whole narr narrative was gonna fall to like ashes or something. Um, I I think in the final book that yeah, there's a scene where without her, but not much of it. And then with this time though, and a few other stories I've written, I've felt that same like what, what do you call that? The same tether where I was like, man, I've been with this character like the whole time and i is this something i'm doing by accident you know we've all read these sort of epic um horror horror novels where there's like this ensemble cast and many different characters and, and it'll be going back you know from all these different threads and and that sort of thing and i kept finding myself like sort of with this one character so in this case i could uh, i could see when i started that it was all going to be this guy james and he, and he asked this girl out, and, and it was going to all be sort of from his angle. Am I doing okay? Am I coming off well to her? Does she think I'm funny? That kind of thing. But very early on, I was like, hey, hey, man, don't get stuck with just him. Like, you know, that you've done that before, like, so many times. Don't get stuck with just James. This is like these two are together. You're not telling this kid James' a story. You're, you're telling this, this duet, as you say, this, the, this, these two teenagers falling in love. And there's no, it, there's no way that just James' side is going to be as effective as, as the two of them together. So I do think there, there was a, a conscious um, decision in the early going of, if I'm the cameraman, there was a conscious decision of like, okay, you know, now let's switch back to Amelia. Okay, now let's switch back to James, right? You know, like over and over. Now like an aerial of them both. Now, you know, from beneath. Now let's get them from beneath as if I was like filming them the whole time, but with equal screen time. Right. That's that's the way it feels. So even when they're together and you and you if you move from one perspective to the other, you still sense the other there. It's it's really kind of weird. And but in the scenes where they're separate, uh you could think of those as almost like solo moments. So if you want to use the song as an analogy, you 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 know, it, you've written a really cool song. That's yep. that's you know thirty thousand words, <laughs> with and it, and it's a duet with a kick ass drummer. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> well, you mentioned in the piece that you recently wrote on music about your fiance Allison writing a song or singing a song called "The Courtship of Amelia." Hey, Allison. <laughs> do you want Allison? Do you want to sing the courtship of Amelia for them? <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna have a live song. <laughs> do you want to do it? 
<laughs> this is like a this is horror fest. <laughs> hey, what hey, what what about like even if you just came in and like sang the first line? You don't even have to bring the guitar. <laughs> I'm, I'm, using the, I'm, I'm using the microphone to yell across the house. I, I, I know. <laughs> this is like, this is the most impromptu moment I think we've had on the This Is Hara podcast. I mean, when we had Jessica McHugh on, Bob was pretty sure that we'd get some singing in this. But yeah, <laughs> there's maybe even a guitar. This is even better. <laughs> Alison, this is your conscience speaking. You must not accept the guitar and come sing, for this is horror. No, just one line? <laughs> well, I was gonna... I was gonna ask, I mean, we don't have to get her to do it live right now, but is there a way okay. that maybe she could record it or record some of it and our listeners could hear it? Yes, that can happen for sure. Um, I'll talk to her about it's, that. It's, it's I'm probably a little that. easier for her than just being <laughs> pressurized. Like, right, we're live, Alison. You are being silent. Right. <laughs> right now, she's rolling her eyes at me somewhere in the house. Um, but um, yeah, no, I will talk to her about that for sure. But I'm not. I gotta say, I'm not convinced that she's not gonna come in here and do this. So let's just let's just see if she does. So but just, yeah, it's just gonna be a dramatic moment, kind of like. <laughs> pro wrestling style just when you're least expecting it the lights are gonna go off the audio is gonna go weird and her music's gonna hit <laughs> <laughs> yep i'm gonna get body slammed yeah probably <laughs> that could that could be on the cards <laughs> so you know yeah. i mean the the water theme with a house at the bottom of the lake that's something that I mean, for me, having a great interest in Japanese horror, water and wells and dark places are integral and are really a part of the fabric of traditional Japanese ghost stories. But, I mean, when you think about horror and water, what are the stories that you think of? What does it bring to mind? Well, it's funny. While while working on it, you know, and this, this 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 must happen to anybody who starts a horror story without um, uh, what's the right phrase? Uh, without knowing exactly where it's going at first, right? Without it being outlined or whatever. At the very beginning, I'm like, oh, okay, I got them, got them in this house, and then you start thinking, and of course, all that goes to your mind is like the uh, these other underwater creatures you know like the creature from the black lagoon jaws all this and you're like wait wait hold on hold on, hold on. I, I don't want to i don't want a giant lizard man in this house no i don't <laughs> hold on i don't want a giant like scary fish in this house and then you start and then you're like trying to get creative oh what about a woman with fish lips wait wait hold on you know what what about this what about that you know and then it, it is there well there was sort of like um a referencing of of all those um like yeah like underwater like movies and not not underwater movies but water horror stories but i was thinking about like i thought of the ring during this and i have you know what i haven't read is the wind up bird chronicles but i hear that i hear that that one's like masterful that's a well story right isn't it yeah that's haruki murakami so that that'd be a great place to kind of jump into his work have you is read that, much of his fiction? Nope. Zero. None. And and that guy that I told you about earlier, my go-to guy in town, is like, yeah, you got to read this one. And I just haven't haven't done it yet. But I, I keep hearing that that book is, you know, whatever, as good as it gets. I'm really excited to do it. But the for the thing that was so really, really exciting to me about it being an underwater story and taking place underwater and... One day I wouldn't mind actually figuring out the percentage, like how much of this book takes place underwater. But um, the thing that was most exciting to me was the, just the natural uncanniness of, like, of the setting. It's dark, it's cold, it's claustrophobic, it's, um, you know, uh, what's the word? Um, oh, everything's naturally sort of distorted, either you know, by movement, by, you know, the water being displaced by your movements or just the movement of unseen waves. Um, you're only seeing things in pieces through the end of a flashlight. So you're only getting bits and that if you're only getting bits, that means you're also getting a lot of darkness um, in the negative space. 
So it, it was, and if there's like, let's say a mirror down there, oh my gosh, imagine, imagine what you would look like in a mirror in a house at the bottom of a lake. And it really started to become such a naturally frightening setting that I, I stopped thinking about, you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon. And I stopped thinking about Piranha. And I started started realizing that just where they were was something of itself. The setting itself was like a monster. And that's something that I talked to my agent, who you know, um, yeah, Kristen. Yeah. I talked to her and I talked to other people about too that I think it's important to remember with horror that in terms of character development and this or that, the scare is one of the main characters. You know, if I the horror is one of the main characters, even if it's never seen. Like if I see a book cover that said a house at the bottom of a lake, I, or let's say it was a movie, right? And I go into the theater and then, and then I'd see these two, two teens in a, in a canoe. I'm like, Oh my God, where, where they're going to find the house. Right. Okay. So what's in the house, whatever. In other words, that sort of, what is it that unknown scary thing that you're, I wouldn't say, expe yeah, expecting because you know, it's a scary story is a character of its own. And so it went from trying to figure out, you know, again, you know, what, what, you know, what creature is down here to realizing that like the house itself, the, um, and the off camera, um, uh, sense of horror were characters of their own. And then that's not to say that nothing lives down there. That, that, that's, I'm not spoiling it either way. I'm just saying that I realized early on that, yeah, that house was a character all of its own, and so was the foreboding. It's like session nine. Session nine, the the damn you know, the damn medical uh, asylum is the the main star of the whole movie. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen session nine, but no. I know exactly where you're coming from. You've never yeah, seen I, session nine? No, man. And and you're gonna think that I'm lying. You're, you, you, I swear to God, you're going to think I'm lying right now, but the other day, someone told me to watch that. So you and I both had, like, two moments here. Well, actually, both from you to me, where now i got to read Wolfen and watch Session 9, and I will do both. But to, uh, keep going about it. I don't, I don't know much about it. Well, it's, a, it's, it, it, it's the main star. These guys, they're, they're, they're getting out of asbestos in old buildings, and so they get a contract at this medical, uh, this abandoned asylum. And so they filmed it in the abandoned uh, Danvers uh, Asylum that it, I think now has been actually torn down. But they actually got permission to film most of the uh, you know interior scenes actually in this abandoned asylum. And, I mean, there's stuff still there. There's medical equipment there. There's stretchers, wheelchairs. So they really didn't have to do anything with it and it's a very uh claustrophobic movie it's 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 very it's very creepy uh very well done extremely well acted uh and it has david caruso in it so you know if you, if you don't like him uh because i'm not a big uh, david caruso fan but it's probably one of his better roles but uh it's just uh you need to really check it out it's the star but the whole i mean like i said the the setting is the right. true star of the of the movie? Yeah, and um, I, you know, it's, I, that's, it, it is. A, I don't want to say a pet peeve because I'm that makes me sound like I'm annoyed or something. But it is, you know, when I hear like people talking about character development, and of course I get it. I love. I, I'm all for it. And I, there's there's plenty of character development in the house at the bottom of a lake. But sometimes with scary stories, I don't necessarily need them. And I and I think like let's take Twilight Zone for example. You kind of just start in a scene. I don't need to know much more than the guy, you know, here's a family man or, or here's a banker. I don't need much more than that because the off camera character is the twilight zone. And I know, and I know that we are like this guy, whoever he is, is going to be in a, like an upside down twisted situation that I cannot wait to, to witness. And so I do think that for the non horror reader, you know, off you, you'll, when, when someone says, like, oh, there wasn't enough character development, usually I, I can ask them, like, do you read a lot of, like, scary stories? Like, no, not really. And I'm like, oh, all right, okay. Because, because, you know, at least for me, the idea, the conceit of, you know, all these stories that we're all writing, these books and these short stories and these film ideas, 
the conceit, the idea is the most exciting, important part to me. So I can see a film that you know is flat, or the acting's real bad, or 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 whatever it is. But if the idea is just brilliant, I'm still gonna walk away like, wow, man, that idea, you know. And same thing with books, like, oh, it's not, yeah, it's clunky, but man, the you know, Philip K. Dick gets that a lot, where he's real. People think he's real clunky or this and that, but what an what an idea guy, right? Right. And so, yeah. And so I and so to me, sometimes, maybe often, even the idea is a character also. I could I could definitely see where that comes from. There's certain things that I, that I like that uh, maybe it, especially especially in film, it's kind of hard to find it for me in in actual written work. But in film, you know, uh, the concept like uh, I know one of my uh, one of my favorite films is Constantine. I cannot stand Keanu Reeves. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, my dog, my mom's dog, can act better than him. Now, I have not seen John Wick, and I heard that was the perfect vehicle for him. So, and I really want to see it. I've heard too many, you know, really, really good friends that really are into movies say, you you would enjoy it. So, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll have to watch it. I just haven't watched it yet. So, I mean, of course, and he butchered Constantine. Uh, the movie has got some great cast. It's got some great ideas. And I love it because of the idea of what it did. Now, was it exactly true to the comic no it wasn't but it was the idea of it and and that's why it's one of my favorite movies and i'll watch it again and again and again and i'll cringe every time i see him going did they got a damn american to play a brit but yeah (laughs) you know (laughs) but that's and it's just it, it grates my nerves but uh i still love the movie you know because because of the idea of it the, the yeah. idea is that it's the idea of it and the ideas that it's trying to present to us. Yeah, exactly. And, and to me, that that's the most thrilling part because it's like, you know, I, I you know what it would kind of, this kind of reminds me, it, not maybe to this extent, but where some people love a guitar player for being like a virtuoso and, and other people like a guitar player for being like strange and unique where like, let's say like, like Neil Young solos are really like choppy and, and 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 off and and just a str- little stranger than say you know Jeff Beck right? right and a lot but there are those people that are like oh my gosh he I mean he he's so fluid on the guitar and he's so this and then there's the opposite school or whatever to me this is similar in the way of I of course I love and respect you know brilliant writing you know I I remember going through a period of. I just couldn't believe how good Nabokov and Fitzgerald and what's that, Truman Capote, and I couldn't believe how fluid these guys were, you know. It was just blowing my mind with each book I was reading. But then what I felt like each of them were lacking was was that, like, just that that amazing idea, you know. It was like F. Scott Fitzgerald could write about a party all night, you know, in conversations, and like, okay, yeah, that, that's cool, but... But I and he writes so wonderfully, man. I would love to see F. Scott Fitzgerald write a werewolf story. You know, I would love to just to see those together, and then in that kind of thing. But so from a right from the start for me, even like in high school, reading these classic guys and what and girls, whatever, it was always like, oh, and with movies too, like, okay, yeah, these are we celebrate all these actors and whatever, but like. Who thought of this? Like, who thought of the character that Tom Cruise is playing, you know? And I think about that a lot. Everyone so gets so excited about a character or, a, or an actor, a celebrity, and I can't help but think of, like, yeah, but, like, who, who's the, you know, the writers? Sh- I, I, I think that we should be going to see movies that certain writers wrote rather than movies that, you know, star a certain guy or girl, you know? Oh yeah, that's right. If anything comes up by Christopher McQuarrie or something like that, I'm going to be in, immediately interested in it. Uh, yep. You know, uh, because I've seen you know Way of the Gun, The Usual Suspect, so I kind of know where he's coming from. It's kind of like I follow certain directors and things like yep. that, and a, a certain I follow certain actors because I feel like that they may work with certain types of directors. So, uh, you know, and that's to me that's that's where I get into movies and things like that. And I think now we're starting to see with the you know with the breakdown of the big presses and every, everything in horror going into small presses to great critical acclaim and to great sales and things like that. You're almost at the point now to where you can actually follow presses, you know. Oh, yeah. And, uh, 
I mean, if you're if you're not, you're stupid. No, you're not yeah. stupid. You just you, you haven't opened your eyes. You haven't seen the whole picture. So I'm gonna take that back. I'm not gonna call somebody stupid. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but follow follow presses because I think you'll be yeah. surprised. <laughs> yep. And then and so this is not from where I'm coming from. This is not all to say like I have the best idea in the world. But what I am saying is that with a house at the bottom of a lake, I I was very careful to nurture James, Amelia, and the idea. So that to those to me were like the three main characters. The or, or uh, you could say the setting, because the idea in this case was uh, so entwined with the setting. So, but so it was very you know those were the three I guess characters that I had my eye on the whole time. Yeah. Well, thinking of it like that, if you uh, if you use the setting as a character, then you did a really good job of. Uh, what they call submerging the eye. <laughs> uh, that's an old uh, uh, Chucky e. P uh, euphemism there on writing. It's, you know, if you write in first person to, you know, you'd want to submerge the eye and stay away from saying, I did this, I did that. And so uh, that's another way to looking at it too. Uh, I could see how it could go both ways. So, but yeah, I, to me, I love it when someone can do, the the you know for for what it's worth head hopping with such grace because usually it's clunky and you're like going oh wait hold on where am I at who whose head am I in why are they going back and forth but yours is just smooth and it flows I love it no I, mean, I, I also love that phrase head hopping that's cool that's a and that's a cool uh, title for a short story too that could be a really scary short story head hopping. <laughs> I do. I like that. You can get you, gross pretty fast. <laughs> I'm. I am the kind of guy that like I say that kind of thing, and then like six months later, you're like, "Wait a minute, he has a short story called Head Hop." I can't <laughs> believe he did. I was out to dinner with this fella. Allison and I were out to dinner with these two friends, and the guy starts telling us a ghost story of his, and he's like, "So me and my buddy, we moved into this apartment, and you know, we walk in. It's got two bedrooms, and we flipped a coin for the bigger bedroom." And I was like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, wait, uh, the bigger bedroom, like, and then he, I was like, is that yours? He was like, wait, what do you mean? I was like, well, you just, like, you flipped a coin for the bigger bedroom, you just, that's just something to say, right? He's like, yeah, what do you mean? I was like, the, the phrase, though, the bigger bedroom, like, I, that, I'm going to use that. I'm going to write a story called The Bigger Bedroom. He's like, okay. And then, <laughs> like, a year later, it was published in Chiral Mad 3, and I bring it, and I show him this story, you know? I'm like, hey, man, look, yeah, here's the bigger bedroom. It's published in this awesome anthology. And, I mean, he's, like, blanched. He's like, what are you talking about? So when I get when I get excited about short story ideas, like, you don't be surprised. Of the things that you're saying right now, May, who knows? <laughs> well, head, head hopping sounds like a Black Mirror episode by Charlie Brooker. I mean, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. that sounds like it would have all the kind of technological elements and some sort of social commentary and you know probably to do with mind control it's a good title yeah no doubt and black mirror for me i don't know if both of you or if either of you have seen it but i think that's almost the modern day equivalent to the twilight zone I, I've been hearing such good things about it that that the other day I looked at um I, I keep hearing that season three, which is the new one, right? Right. I keep hearing that it's um the best one. And I went and read all the plot synopsis for each for each episode this season. I think there's six or seven, and ev each one of them sounded amazing to me. So I'm gonna do it. I haven't done it yet, but I'm gonna do it. Um, I'm gonna I need to get involved with that show. I watched the first episode. The first first is season one or first is season first, three? The first, yeah, where the prime minister bangs a bit. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> well, that, that, was, so, that was quite funny because that came out before the allegations of David Cameron actually. Oh, I know. It's like, I'm like, <laughs> I've seen this before. Yeah. Weird deal. I've seen it in a show. It's life imitating art. How strange. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. But that episode blew me away. It was incredible. It was strong. Uh, it was well produced. Uh, you know, and I didn't know what to. I was like, "All right, let me do it. I'm, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it right. I'm gonna watch episode one, season one. Boom!" And I watched it. And it's like an hour and fifteen minutes later, my jaw was hanging on the ground, going, "That was insane." 
That was like a, a like a miniature movie that they just spent. Like we got like five million dollars. Let's blow it all on this. And it's, <laughs> it's like it's fucking great. Yeah. And I was like, and I haven't I haven't gone back to it. I've just been busy. I'm yeah, busy. <laughs> it's hard, man. It's hard to take it all in, isn't it? There, you know, it's funny when you when you you know you're at some at some some days you feel like you got a real firm grasp on the genre and then and, and everything that's going on and then other days you're like, wow, man, I'm so far behind. I could sit there and watch shows like that, but then I'd get emails like, "Why didn't this get done?" Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, that's what it is. Yeah. You're right. That's from, what it is. From it's someone we may or may not be talking with. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't binge watch anything. Uh, I, if I do, I have to plan it. You know, and it's, uh, it, it's just, man, you, you you have to pace yourself in this world. It's just, it's it's important. You have to experience, but you also have to pace yourself. You know, that that's something also I recently I was talking to Allison because I have, I've been noticing this strange thing with writing where like if I do a certain I mean, again, the work count, whatever, let's just say write for two hours, th- let's say three hours, you write for three hours a day and then one day you just feel like you want to keep going. And but I know that if I do that marathon session today that I'm going to destroy this sort of like routine that I got going. So whereas it sounds at first like like an awesome thing, like, dude, don't deny yourself a marathon session, go for it. But then the next day you're like, oh yeah, I, I don't know. And then all of a sudden you're like, you've fallen off the rails and a week later you get back on track. There is right. a pacing and steadiness to it all. And you know, I think that we we hear like that from from the greats, you know. Uh we hear of that kind of thing. You know, a lot of my heroes are like like Hitchcock, um, Stephen King, Woody Allen, um, all these guys that with such like sort of a yearly, steady like career pace, you know, and that kind of thing isn't. Um, of course, they have marathon sessions, but that kind of thing is as you're saying. That's like there's a pacing involved there. There's a pacing. You have to be regular at it, you know. And it, but here's the thing. It's so weird. It's like you know, reading about like years and years ago. Uh, and when when Peter Straub first started publishing his books, uh, there was a there was a gap, you know, kind of in between Floating Dragon and Coco, and uh, and and, uh, and that's about the time that the Talisman came out. And so and I always like to why why was there such a gap here? Was it because him and Stephen King were writing this book? And so I read an interview that was in a magazine, and I, I don't even know if you can find it today, but it but. One thing that, that stuck in my mind was Peter Straub said, never take a year off from writing. Oh, yes, yeah. I did. He goes, and it and it hurt me. Today, I don't think that he would have that same outlook. Because what he what he's produced since then is probably a, a, like to me, it's almost like right after those initial novels. And it's really like five or six before Coco if you count everything that he's done. Uh, and then since then, it's like he's had greater achievements since then. But those three novels are just iconic. You know, you got Ghost Story, Shadowland, and uh, and Float Dragon. And then you have a completely different style with Coco, but yet it's still just as visceral, just as, as hard-hidden, you know. And so going back to that, a pace, I think that in his case, and it could be with other people, that – even though he took a year off, he ruined his pace. He basically just said, you know what? Hey, I'm not writing for a year. And he came back better. You, you know, so, I, I totally know what you are talking about right now in, in a, in like a, in the music side of things too, where you would, you, anytime you felt like, or I, anytime I have felt like, like, Oh, you know, I, I don't have it anymore. Or, or I ruined something or some pace or this or that. And then, you know, a year passes from that moment, and I look back. I'm like, "Wow, dude, you were you were working on like your best stuff yet, and you just you just didn't see it. Maybe because when you're working at a higher, I don't want to say higher level, but at a different level or something, you you don't recognize the parameters of it. You know, when you're first starting off, you're just I mean, you could write a novel on just fumes alone. You're so excited, right? Right, so exactly. Then, you know, five years later, you're like. Oh, I don't, I'm not writing with that energy. Oh, well, maybe that's good. <laughs> Compare what exactly. you're writing now with, with what you're writing then. And the same thing with songs or whatever. And, and, and that actually kind of reminds me of when you, you know, 
Well, if, if if someone took a photo of, of you today and you're like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't look so good. And then five years later, you're like, oh, my God, man, I look so good. And it's like that sim- that same thing seems to happen with 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 art. Yeah. Um, well, with art, everything, everybody thinks that you progress like in the, you, you, if you progress and you go up and you grow and you learn that it's a steady incline. And it's not. It's these steps. And some steps are higher yep. up than others. It's like some guy who is like on acid designed the stairwell. You know, <laughs> he's like, you got a tiny step right here. There's a whole bunch of tiny steps. One big giant step. And every time you have a big giant step is when you have this like growth spurt and you, you learn so much. And I think, like, if you go back to what I was talking about with Peter Straub, he had this one gigantic step of something in his life that he had to overcome. No telling what it was, and we'll probably never know, and it, we don't need to know. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is that he overcome it. He took a year off from writing. He did it, and he come back, and he was even better than before. I'm not recommending anybody take a year off, but if things happen, you can get back to things. You know, and I know that so many people – that I know, and I can sit here and name names that are in, in my Facebook feed that have had so many problems, and they come back, and it's like, and they're coming back to critical acclaim, and it's just like, wow, this is, you know, and this, these are people who, were like, you know, last year said, I'll never write again. Oh, uh, yeah. And so, you know, and to, to see that, uh, sometimes, you know, you, you, man, you just gotta, you gotta go with the flow. Yeah, I could not agree more. You know, when when I first met Allison, she was sort of the one who who pointed out to me, you know, um, how like an, there's no reason for an artist to ever stop getting better. And it's kind of like what you're talking about, the acid staircase. We'll call it the acid stairs for now. <laughs> um, where, where, you know, Hitchcock was walking up the acid stairs till the day he died. I mean, he, he, you could argue, you know, in the 60s, he's better than the 70s, whatever, but... You know, he was he was still Hitchcock was making his best movie. He, uh, he made Psycho at age sixty. What the what? You know, you know, exactly. and, and 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 same thing with all the all these guys who like steadily go go go. And I think there is some sort of misconception that an artist has to be very young or so. Or you do your best work when you're young. Oh, stop it. You know, sometimes in some yeah, some guys do and some guys don't. Who cares? So as you say, go with the flow. Yeah. And I think in writing, you can often see a pattern of people getting better as they develop that's almost yeah. a profession where in your 50s and 60s is when you really hit your stride because you've not only got all that writing and reading experience but you've got all that life experience to draw from yep that's me i'll be 50 next year there you go <laughs> <laughs> i'll be hitting my stride <laughs> fantastic <laughs> 50 next year <laughs> and it's so weird saying that i don't feel like i'm 50 at all you know? i mean i'm 18 i act like i'm 21 so there you go <laughs> yeah i remember when i was a teenager thinking it would be interesting when i grow up and then as you get older and older you realize mentally you're still kind of in the same place you don't truly grow up <laughs> So I, know, it, I have those days where I'm like, when I grow up, I, wait a second, I'm growing up, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> but I still feel like it's like, when I grow up, I want to do this. <laughs> but I used to think like all the adults seem so mature and in control and you realize it's just a fucking act. We just <laughs> pretend <laughs> we're in control that. so that the children <laughs> think that we've got our shit together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My my drummer and Derek and I call that the myth of professionalism. We, you know, you, when we we started lying, we we lived in New York. All, the band lived in New York for four years, and we would just lie to places if they asked if we had experience, because we're like, oh, like at a coffee shop, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, no, I, I I have experience. I worked here and here, and just made it up. Right. And then the guy would the guy would be like, invariably, the guy the boss would be like, well, let me show you how we do it here, and you're like, okay. No, oh yeah, I might as well see how you do it here. And then I'm actually seeing it then for the first time ever in my life. You know, yeah. like they're going to train you. They're going to train you their way anyway. And we started to realize that, like, how, how many other people are like lying out here? You know, who like is, is our boss lying about something? And it all started to become this big myth of professionalism. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe there's uh, the workings of another short story there. <laughs> yeah. Just like this town where everyone's lying. <laughs> Nothing is <laughs> no, as it seems. 
doing. Yeah, no one. That sounds like a Ray Bradbury story. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> we're create we're creating we're creating a monster. We're creating short stories is what we're doing. Right, right. Well, this, <laughs> this, this is what I... happens when you get Josh on the podcast. Last time we mapped <laughs> out an entire film adaptation of Bird Box. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Let's let's jump into our Patreon questions. Okay. We've got a question from Eric Sparkman. So. In a previous interview, you compared Bird Box to a black and white episode of The Twilight Zone. What would you compare a house at the bottom of a lake to? Uh, I ha- is his name Eric? Is yeah. that what it was? Yeah. Eric. Eric. Wow. I, that is a really awesome question. Um, because with the, with the novel follow-up to Bird Box, I had thought in the same terms of what is this? And with that one, I was thinking of this sort of deep oil sort of painting. And I think that, and, and as I told you, I was working on a house at the bottom of the lake at the same time, the rough draft at least. And I, you know, the silly answer is watercolors. And I really, I think the, the, um, the real answer is it's, yeah, I guess with house at the bottom of the lake, I, I see it's definitely not black and white. It's just deep, um, you know, blues, blacks, uh, greens, oil painting, the kind of thing that, but I do see, bizarrely, I see if they were both paintings, this painting would be a much larger one than Bird Box. You know, if you walked into the same um, gallery, Bird, Bird Box to me would be a much smaller black and white, um, you know, uh, work on one wall and then on, on the end of the wall that might be like, a house at the bottom of the lake could, could take up like a whole wall or something by itself. And I'm not sure if that's because of the, the love in it or the, or, or, or maybe I think it has more to do with the, there's, there's something, there's some, something subconsciously going on, I think with the characters um, throughout the book and their relationship to the house. And so I, I think that their canvas would need more room. Whereas bird box is a very claustrophobic tight, like arrow of a story. So to answer, I would say, um yeah whereas Blur- bird box is um black and white this one i would say is a, a a grand dark oil painting and i guess it's so big because it comes back to the idea of the water and how expansive it is i mean if you think of water if you think of the ocean it's seemingly infinite mm-hmm. i think i think that also ties into why we find it so scary as a character generally why the water is so intimidating. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome question. Oh, I, just, I just wanted to say that again, Eric. Awesome question. Well, the next question is from Sarah Reed. And Sarah said she had the pleasure of seeing you and Alison read some of your work in the tunnels beneath the Stanley Hotel. Uh, It was more of a performance than a reading. And afterward, you described how you've designed your readings to be very interactive for your audience. Sarah would like to know, will you be doing more of that with the new book? And do you have a performance planned out or any details you can share about the process? Another great question. Um, and I, yeah, I, I know Sarah well. We had awesome, well, I know her from, from um, at the Stanley. We had awesome conversations about her life and mine. And, um, and I know her online since then, too. But um, I do know, I almost, I mean, why? it's not like it's a big secret what, what I have in mind. But I definitely do have um, a performance uh, in mind for this one. And there's a fella in town who owns a bookstore. It's called BookBeat. Uh, him and his wife own it. Mm-hmm. And the guy has like an art installation where he, it's an aquarium, where, where it's like a giant aquarium where he sets up like a false sort of glass and behind it is everything supposed to be underwater. So my plan is to get together with him and discuss how we could, um, you know, while I narrate the story, 
it, the character. Yeah, I guess the characters would act it out, or so, it doesn't have to be acted out literally, you know. But it would be, yeah, the audience would be seeing an underwater scene while the the band or or musician friends play a scary movie soundtrack, that kind of thing, just like we did with the bird box readings. And while I narrate, yeah. I mean, look, the idea of me alone at a podium reading is just, it's so silly. I don't have a scary voice. You know, I don't know. I don't know if any of us do, you know, all of us, all of us horror authors. I can't imagine any of us getting up there and, you know, a few of us do, I guess. But, but, um, so the way I see it is it's like, and maybe this is, this is because of the band, but I see it as a, Hey man, this is a chance to like put on a little bit of a show and it, it doesn't have to be that much of a show. Um, you know, we're not talking about like can can girls and, and, and lights, right? But you know, with Bird Box, it was as simple as blindfolding the audience and playing a soundtrack. And in this case, maybe a little more expansive than that, uh, talking to uh, the bookbeat owner about you know how to how he does his underwater scene, and then again having like a soundtrack. So yeah, definitely want to do something. I don't know exactly where we're gonna like where where what cities we would do it in yet but maybe michael that's something you and i could talk about in terms of you know which cities might it be might it be cool to go do that in you know to promote the book um but yeah definitely yeah definitely and i mean if you set something up with that guy if we can create a reading there it would be great to get a video version of that and then we can put that on youtube and all of our listeners yep. can check it out because, I mean, like, yeah. your, your performances are the kind of things that we want to share with everyone. So if we if we can put that online, then those people who can't physically get there get to experience a snippet of it and get to have a taste for what your live performances are like. Yeah, no doubt. You're right. That's a great idea. And and the reading should be at BookBeat because why not? The store is amazing to begin with. So, yeah, why not? Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I mean, that that's the kind of thing where the potential for the video is so enormous that you could almost just have a private reading and you could record that and put it yeah. online. And I think it will do very well. And, you know, like irrespective of how much even from a kind of marketing point of view that would convert into sales in terms of just creating a cool video piece and giving people something else to enjoy i think it's worth it for that alone yeah i think that you're right i think you just said something key which was like the private um reading and and only because in terms of like, hey, let, let's get a good, let's get a really good one on film, that kind of thing. Versus like, well, we filmed it, which is, you know, normally how it goes. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's no reason why you can't then take that reading and have it as a public performance, not on film. Yep. But for the filmed version, I think a private reading would be great. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. You, you know, so I, I, Go on, sorry. I was going to say, I'll follow up with him tomorrow about it. So, yeah, yeah. that sounds great. <laughs> Something else that Sarah said, which we just glossed over, but you reading your work in the tunnels beneath the Stanley Hotel. Let, let's not just gloss over that. That must have been <laughs> a tremendous experience in itself. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was, man. It was pitch black down there and... I mean, just to up the ante here, I, I, we were planning on doing Bird Box, right? Mm. And we're walking towards the building, you know, from the parking lot. And Allison's like, hey, do you have any ghost stories? And I was like, well, well, I mean, yeah, but we've only ever done Bird Box, you know? And she was like, well, we should do a ghost story. I'm like, oh, I know, but Allison, like, we, we've never done it out, you know, out loud. Like, no, we're not going into the you know, basement of the, the tunnel beneath the Stanley and reading a story for the first time, by the way, with Jack Ketchum also reading a story after us. Oh, so it nice, was like, nice. it was like, no, we're not, no, we're going to do Bird Box. And then, I, you know what, something just struck me. And this is pr my favorite thing about Allison in my life is that she's always, she's just more spontaneous or something. So I was like, okay, you know what? You're right. Let's do it. Okay. Look, you're going to play the character Barry and the mom. And she's never read this story. It it actually was the bigger bedroom, the one that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, earlier, and we went down there, and 
Yeah, for the fr- and Allison had painted herself up in a really cool way. And so for the first time ever, read that story out loud, and Allison was awesome as the little boy and the mom. And um and you know, like pitch black with I don't know, I don't know how many um I don't know how many people were there. I don't even remember it, it that way exactly. And then we did our story, and then Jack Ketchum did a story, I think, called The Rifle. Do you guys know that one? Uh, I'm familiar, it's great. I'm I'm familiar, not familiar with, with a it. lot of his work, but I'm not sure it, it about just, that one. Was, how does it, it go? It was a great one. It was um, oh, horribly dark and disturbing. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Jack Ketchum, all right. <laughs> no, hold on, hold on. It's coming to me. That sounds like Jack Ketchum. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And um, you've really yeah, narrowed so that, it down there. <laughs> and I heard that there was a tour the next day through the tunnels or some other event, but people were down there that had been there at the reading, and the reading was brought up. And supposedly, someone heard a ghost say, I liked it. Somebody heard a ghost say, like, I liked it about the reading. And then so so, in, oh, in, oh, in the Stanley Hotel. <laughs> yep. They, where they filmed The Shining. No, where the Stanley Hotel is where Stephen King stayed and thought of okay, okay, the Shining. So yeah, okay. So that's so yeah. We're we're, we're we're excuse me. We're even deeper than that. We're at the inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And the also the inspiration for, for the sea one. And then there's a ghost there that liked your story. <laughs> that's, you know these the, a few people. They're like, I swear, and li- like, th- listen, this happened. Someone said I liked it, and then when we were looking around for who said it. You know, nobody fessed up to saying it. And they're like, and the person that was standing next to it or something heard it in the open space next to her or something. Yeah, but somebody, that's what they say. Best fucking blurb ever. You need to use that. <laughs> yeah. You know what? You're <laughs> that, totally fucking right. I liked it. The ghost at the Stanley yeah. Hotel. <laughs> yeah, I liked it. A ghost at the Stanley Hotel. That's the deal. <laughs> Dude, I'm using that. That is brilliant. Awesome, Bob. You, you should. You definitely should. <laughs> if the ghost had said it to a house at the bottom of the lake, I'd have been putting that in the blurbs. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Everybody's like, has this ghost read other books? <laughs> what's, what's the ghost opinion of this book? <laughs> so, oh, this, man. That's kind of a, a bad uh, rush of readings down there. I just want a blurb. No, that. <laughs> And that's another great story idea. A guy that goes in there and reads, <laughs> reads for the approval of a ghost that he never sees. I love that. And what happens to those whose stories the ghost doesn't like? There you go. <laughs> I didn't like games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have a story idea similar to that with uh, somebody who uh, her husband is affected by ghosts and uh, the wife is jealous because she can't see the ghost. And well, there's some events that happened 20 something years later, you know, that, you know, then this one character who's kind of friends with you know, this couple, he, he starts to realize that there was a reason why she couldn't see the ghost and the reason why she couldn't act with, interact with the ghost. And so it's, 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 it's under development. So, yeah, no, that sounds cool. It's in awesome. development hell. Let's call it that. It's in development. <laughs> One day I'll, I'll finish it up. Well, it'll obviously come into fruition next year as you reach your golden years of fifties, as we said before. Yes, yes, uh, that will be my my fifty. <laughs> you know, Bob, Bob, with short stories, I, I've been starting to put like sort of immediate deadlines on myself, like. You know, come on, man. You like I know I could write, you know, between three and seven thousand words within like you know a week's time, that kind of thing. So anytime I have sort of a an opening, or no, even when I don't have an opening from uh, like a book, like a rewrite or that kind of thing, I'll be like, okay, you gotta. I'll give myself like a phantom deadline, like you know, okay, by November fifteenth, this short story has to be done, and then by December first, this one. And it's really, it's really been working out because you know. All of us are like men of many ideas, right? And, and yeah. after a while, man, that backlog can get kind of intimidating to the point where when you're almost afraid to have another idea. And I mean, that's a bad place to be in, right? So I'm really, I've really been working on uh, trying to not 
not rush them, but like, come on, you have to have this one done by then and this one done by then. Even if it's just a shitty rough draft, just let's get it down, you know, that kind of thing. And how does the music tie into your writing routine? Because it sounds like you're writing every day, but are you also doing something towards creating new music every day or does that happen more in phases? Well, we have a very interesting thing happening in our band, which is that um, it, the band started, when we started, we, in our first album, had, we had two singer, uh, two lead singer, like songwriters, me and a fella named Mark Owen, a girl, like best friend of mine named Mark Owen. Mm. And we made, an, we made, a, we recorded a ton of songs together, you know, lived in New York, we toured, but then we made our first sort of official album as a band. Mark was one of the singers, but then Mark left the band like shortly thereafter. And then it became just me, the drummer and bassist for what was like eight or seven or eight years or something. And then just recently, very recently, Mark called us up and he's like, hey, you know, and at this point it had been like 12 years because we added another fella named Stephen Palmer. Um, he's been around for years and, and on two albums, two albums that I love. And then Mark called up and he's like, hey, I, I'm moving back to the area, to Detroit, and I'd love to play with you guys again. And it kind of struck me like, wow, what an awesome, odd thing this could be for a band to have their first and like ninth album have like two lead singers. But the, you know, eight in there, seven in between are, are, it was just me and Derek and Chad. And, and I think that's kind of a cool, cool, strange thing to do. And I think, and I'm not trying to pat us on the back, but I think a lot of bands would have been like, no, you know, well, maybe a side project or that's not our identity or something. But we're just looser than that, you know? And I'm, so I'm like, yeah, Mark, come on. So what's happening right now is we are, and we are practicing tomorrow, actually. Um, we're, it's funny, we're like learning a whole like new set pretty much, which is also like refreshing. You know, we've been playing, we have a lot of songs, so it's not like we've been playing the same songs forever. But to welcome back like a best friend who's not, it, it, he, he doesn't just play the tambourine. I mean, he's a lead singer for crying out loud. And so to welcome him back, it's like we're now in the stages of sort of like rebuilding, you know, like, okay, now we know six songs together. Whereas before Mark joined, we knew like 50 songs together, the other four of us, you know? So that's what we're, that's the stage we're in right now. But I have to admit that, you know, for a long time, I either wrote a novel or a song. And for a long time, I didn't have any short stories. If there was a short story idea, it became one of our songs. And if it was a larger idea, it became a novel. And so, but within the, or the last like three, four years, I've been writing short stories and tons of them and really, really loving this. And ha even have a book of short stories that I am hoping to put out with HarperCollins. Well, I'm going to talk to them about that soon. And... But I, because of that, I have noticed that the songwriting sign has, has suffered because of that. I'm not writing as many, or I mean suffered, that's a harsh word, but I'm not writing as many songs. Um, I don't have as many new ones, but I'm like, you know, part of me wonders like how much of the, there is definitely an imbalance going on where I'm writing stories, you know, 95% of the time and songs, you know, when I can kind of vibe. And I was some part of me wonders like how much of that is just from, encouragement meaning there is legitimate encouragement on the writing side you know and so it's very exciting to sit down and write another story you're like oh my gosh I, you know you're asked to be like let's say in an anthology or or you or you want to submit it to a magazine or you're working on your next novel and and it's very exciting to know that you know there's there are like readers that like you know these stories and and it's not that the band is uh, has never received any love or something, but the book side is really, uh, you know, dwarfing it right now or something. And I think that it's up to me to, you know, in, in terms of even, even just for myself and for my bandmates and for the sake of us having been best friends since we were 10 years old and toured the country for six years, it's really up to me to like say to myself, like, Hey, Josh, like write a killer album, write like get like let's get into this let's let's get moving on this side again and and i know that only good things will come from that but i guess i'm just being very honest when i say that that side of it has taken has dipped recently because of all the book stuff
Yeah, and I think in life things can come in phases and it does come back at some point to this idea of not being able to do everything you want. So if you're writing and you're really enthused about that, then you will have a little bit less time for music. But it might be yeah. that there's an album that absolutely lights you up and you spend the majority of a year going intense on that. And then yep, the writing exactly. is perhaps the 5%. So I think as long as you're achieving and you're doing something, that's that's the main thing. I mean, I'm editing, podcasting and writing, but I can't do all at the same time. So at different phases in my life, different strands will take precedent. Yeah, oh, I'm the same way when it comes to I'd spend most of my time writing. Uh, mainly because I have carpal tunnel in my in my hands, but my original creative endeavors were actually in art, you know, drawing and music. Uh, but I mean, even even the art and the music were all horror themed, you know. So I was a kid, I would draw, you know, my my lineup of the Universal monsters. I'd have them all kind of walking, you know, and I drew this lineup, and I do that over and over and over. It's just like practice for me. If I start drawing something now, I won't write because I'll get so into drawing that yeah. I will do I'll do 10 to 15 drawings. And I, I'm going to say like the majority of them will be just crap. It's just stuff I have to get out of my head and I might get one decent drawing out of the whole group. But it, it's, you know, I, I, I just I'm not one of those. I, can, I can't mix those two up. They're just I've tried it. It don't work that way. I will either do oh, one or the other. I know I don't know what it is. I you know I started I I've started to see them as like um like like two giant spheres where where it's it's very hard to exit one and step into the other. Like you think, "Oh, I wrote this morning, now go pick up the guitar." And yeah, sure, you can pick up the guitar and play whatever, but in terms of creating, it's not it's not a very easy uh transition to make and I it must be something that we're not even fully aware of or understand because it must be like the, the state of mind you are in to write is just different than it is to draw, you know, or to work on music. I've, I've exactly. experienced that same freaking thing. And I, and I had it going for a minute. I had a juggling act going for a minute with that. And, and it was great. But most of the time I'm right with what you just said. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's, it's, it's hard for me to juggle it. I'm kind of a, a one, you know, I used to eat one thing at a time. So I'm kind of like OCD like that. But, you know, I mean, and Michael's probably thankful that, you know, I'm not drawing right now because I, I, I wouldn't be doing any writing and things would just pile up. And I'd be like, but I'm drawing. You don't understand. I've got ink all over me. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> and not the kind that he wants. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of this ties in quite nicely to the next Patreon question, which is from okay. Adrian Shotbolt. Adrian would like to know, so with you being a musician, does music have much of an influence on your writing and vice versa? Does the writing influence your music? So I know that we've touched on this a little bit, but if there's anything you'd like to add. Yeah, for sure. Like we were talking before about the drummers behind each book. And I know that, you know, it probably might sound... Adrian, was that the name? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Adrian. I know it might sound a little crazy, Adrian, to talk about that um, in, like, third person, like, oh, there's a drummer, and, and he played... He was real steady, you know, obviously, you're talking about yourself, right? But it does really seem that the the rhythm of the books and the stories um, have just... They have their own rhythm, and I, and I'm, and I do not... Resi I don't resist them, I don't fight them, and I think that there's no question that playing with Derek, our drummer, for you know, again, since for so many years, there's no question that that has influenced that in some way. You know, I would bring a song to the room and I'm, I, I don't tell Derek what to play. You know, we all do what we want, you know. So then whatever he's playing, I'm playing eventually, even though I'm writing, the, wrote the song, I'm playing with, along to his beat, you know. And so I feel like the stories, they inform each other that way. Also, as I was just saying, that for a long time, the short story ideas became our songs they influence each other that way too. Um, I think maybe the biggest 
way that they influence each other, and, and this is also probably the most the least colorful is just like the dedication work, work ethic side of it. You know, I it's with writing, it's very clear, very linear that if I do this much a day or this much, you know, work for this many hours, I will have, um, you know, a novel at the end of a few months, that kind of thing. And so, whereas with music, it's not quite, you're not going to say, well, I'm going to write a song every day or something like that. But that same sort of philosophy is if I dedicate like, you know, if I sit down and I actually work on this for two, three hours a day, we are going to have an album in a, in a few months, the same as like a novel. So there's there's no question they're linked, you know, I mean, and excitedly so. The, the one thing I would like to see is that, you know, the band is real, is real, um, real bright, like real, I don't know if poppy is the right word, but real bright and, and, and positive. And then, and then the books are... I would I would not say that my books are like super dark or disturbing, you know, but they're but they're scary, and I would love to sort of find a middle ground. And I don't mean like writing like you know like a horror album necessarily, but but you know my friend Mark Owen um, had just posted on my page like a I think it was Screaming Lord Such doing like Jack the Ripper, you know, and it was still like a rock song, but with like cool horror lyrics, you know, like that kind of thing. I am trying to look for some way to like meld the two like maybe there's a way to make a, a sci-fi album you know like that how about we make like a sci-fi album like that sounds fun you know so yeah they're definitely linked and i hope to god they always stay linked and and you could tell by my the tone of my voice before i am a little concerned about the music side right now but you know man we're artists it's uh, if i'm concerned about it it's up to me to do something about it and that's really all there is to it well i wonder if you ever considered adapting one of your stories as an album because i know there's been talk of film adaptations and obviously adapting sections of the story for live performance but what about actually adapting a story as an album either with the high strung or as a different musical endeavor is that a consideration yeah like a concept that- album Yes, right. Like a concept album. Sure. Yeah. I would love to, you know, again, it's, it's, it seems it's funny, you know, sometimes I have the philosophy of like, if you're, if you're worried that it's too cheesy or embarrassing, like that's the song you should write because it's probably going to be the most colorful thing you have. And you just don't realize it right now. It's just, it's just something you haven't quite done yet or something, you know, like before the who put out Tommy, they had, they hadn't put out Tommy. You know, so for them to do that was doing something new and different. And they were I know that they were at the height of their powers at that point. But there had to be some nerve, some some anxiousness like, wow, well, how is this going to be received? Are we going to pull this off? That kind of thing. You know, and I think that the same thing with a concept album, like, you know, you're like, oh, I need the greatest concept ever. No, not necessarily. I mean, it could be, you know, about a meteor hitting the earth and that's it. And here we go. Let, let's just write a concept album about that. And, I, and then I think that, you know, I think is if if I was going to approach that, I would have to get rid of that internal governor, you know, like, don't don't be too harsh on the idea side of it. Like, just like, hey, man, like, yeah, like, like, let's use this idea and go with it um, in terms of actually like, you know, an existing book, turning it into an album. Hmm, yeah, maybe. I don't know. But I but I definitely like the idea of a, of a concept album or novel length sort of like album thing. Yeah. It's a case of watch this space and we'll see what happens. Yeah, yes. (laughs) (laughs) So, Jake Marley would like to ask about your writing process. So, again, something we touched on a little bit earlier, but he'd like to know, are you an outliner? Are you a discovery writer or a bit of both? He also said he's really looking forward to the release on Monday. (laughs) So that's fantastic. Wow. Awesome. First of all, Jake Molly is a sweet name. Um, there you go. <laughs> sweet character name, right? Wow, Jake Molly. Wow. Yeah, um, that, that, yeah. Now you, you've, got, you've got a character now. Sorry, Jake. You're, uh, <laughs> you're in a short story. <laughs> right, well, yeah, except that's also a great author name. Um, so, you know, forever, I, I used to look at that like, um, oh, <laughs> if I wrote an outline, well, then it's, then that's just an experimental short story and it's done. 
<laughs> I, I used to look at it that way. Where I'm like, wait, what do you mean? I already know where everything goes. Well, I don't know. That sounds boring to write it now, you know? And then something very recently has changed my mind on that. Um, and it was, it's actually, I, as you know, I'm working on a, a film script for A House at the Bottom of the Lake. Mm. And I really outlined this thing, obviously according to the, to the book, but I really, really outlined it. And then to write the script knowing what was coming next, and it's the first experience I've ever had with that, with knowing, you know, working on a, a written work and knowing exactly where it was going. And, oh my gosh, guys, it was beautiful. It, there was, it, it, became, it became more of like um, the best way to do this versus, you know, oh boy, what happens next, you know? And, and or, or just that uh, sort of subconscious, like, let's just fly. This was, I discovered that I really kind of liked having the outline. So what my answer to that is, I think I've written something like 27 books now, 27 novels or something, and never have used an outline before, always flown by the seat of my pants, you know, written myself into a couple corners, uh, one of which I didn't get out of, and that book I, it still haunts me a little bit. I want to finish it. Another corner I ended up finishing, you know, the second half of that book, like, years later. Um, but for the most part, got through it all, seat of the pants. But, you know, let's reinvent ourselves. I think now, you know, now I am interested in the outline side of it. But if you, Jake Molly, have always been doing things with outline, I would recommend to you to try one by the seat of your pants. Definitely good to mix things up and experiment. Well, you mentioned the film adaptation of A House at the Bottom of a Lake. I wonder what, if anything, can we tell the listeners? I mean, all, I guess, I suppose all I can really say is that there's a producer who, is, who read the book and really, uh, really likes it. And I met with him in Los Angeles and a really, really great guy. Really funny guy, too. And we had a great time, and we talked about it. And he had just his take on it was really, I mean, he was right where you and I are on it, mm. Michael, like in terms of where we were talking in the edits and the things he liked about it and, and were the same things we liked about it and like about it. And so that led to, you know, hey, if, you know, for a moment that I was like, hey, well, do you want to try to find a screenwriter? And he was like, do, do you want to write it? And at this point, um, my manager, that's sort of his, uh, you know, his specialty. He's represented screenwriters for the most part, you know, before, uh, working with me and, and a couple others. So he knows a lot of that world. And, and I, w I wasn't foolish enough to enter this thinking like, Oh, I write novels. A script's got to be easy. No, I wasn't thinking that way. I, I knew it was going to be like different and, and have its own problems or whatever. Just like imagine writing a, uh, like an epic poem, you know, man, it's got to have its own problems, right? Yeah. So, so with, <laughs> yeah, so with my manager, Ryan, and the producers, like, tutelage on, in, in, in terms of, like, the script, you know, format and whatever, um, I got through the first draft, and then now I am in the, in the stage of rewriting it, and I, I think we're going to be done with it, or I'm going to be done with it in the next, like, week or two. So there's no, like, news on it, but I'm writing it, man, and I hope that we find someone that wants to make it. To me, actually similar to Bird Box in a way, to me, because that, like, it just, it, it is, it seems cinematic already, you know, and, and how Bob and I were talking earlier about the camera panning from, you know, the characters sharing screen time and the aerial shots of them above the roof, below them, and, and it just... It's not, I, I'm, this is not to say that I gave the book the best descriptions of, of all time and they're so easy to see, but it is cinematic and Bird Box is too. And so, you know, we just got to find someone that also sees it that way. And that, and that's, that's the, that's where we're at. Definitely. And I wonder, has writing the script for it given you a taste for screenwriting? Is this something you'd like to do more of? And would you like to perhaps write something specifically for the screen yes absolutely um yeah man it is it's it's hard in its own way because well first of all i wouldn't mind if a movie went on tangents but but there there isn't as much room obviously for tangents and that sort of thing i mean it can be i guess the whole movie could be a tangent just call it tangent whatever it could be the coolest <laughs> movie ever but but you know 
<laughs> I have a fantasy of writing like a thousand page script because everyone's always like, oh, it's got to be between 90 and 120. And you're like, oh, stop it. It makes me want to write like, one that's 121 every time. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but anyway, um, yeah, uh, I do. Uh, there's another. I started a novel um, that I was really excited about. I made it about 100 pages deep and I turned to Alice and I was like, you know, this this feels more like a Grand Guinal sort of play to me. And then at about that same time, another a very good friend and filmmaker in town was asking me if I had any screen uh, movie film ideas. And I talked to him about this and I am writing the script for that one as well. So it did start as a novel, but it, it's, it's pretty much from scratch as a, as a script now. And yeah, I, I would like to do like to get more involved, but I also, if I sound a little hesitant, it's because like, you know, this is my first one, oh, it's second one really, but it's my like second like real stab at it, and I just wanna, I don't know, I just wanna see that I can really pull this off before I start saying, yeah, I'm gonna write like twenty of them, you know. I wrote like three movie scripts that I, I'll probably will never do it again. They're none of them are finished, uh, but I, I went into it thinking this has got to be easier than writing a novel. Shoot, it's only a hundred pages. Yeah, I know, I know, man. That, that's if you if you <laughs> if you think that. Future writers of the world, if you think that, don't. Yeah. It's not true. Just not because true. I'm good with dialogue and I don't like writing description, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can write a movie. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a real, real rhythm to it, you know, and that that I think I got now. Like, I, I we, again, did the first draft. I'm really excited about it. But now with the rewrite, I rewrote the first uh, act um, so far. And... I gotta tell you, Michael, it's fun to it's fun to be with these two, James and Amelia, in this script. You know, mm. I, I feel like I'm like sometimes I feel like I'm like their chaperone, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like, okay, guys, now here we are in a script, all right? And so I I need I need the two of you to look just just pretty much say exactly what you said in the book, all right? All right. And you're pretty much going like to Like you said it in the book. Yeah. I'm going to just say it. You know, in fact, James, just say it exactly like you said it in the book. And then, you know, that was a funny moment with the screen, right? Where the script where I started, I started like struggling with their dialogue or whatever. And my manager was like, why aren't you just using the dialogue from the book? And I was like, oh. And he was like, do you realize that what you were just doing was what every author hates when a screenwriter does to their book? You were about to not use anything from the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. He's like, yeah, no, dude, just keep the dialogue that's there. The dialogue's great. Well, and I was like, oh. And it all started to, like, you know, come together or whatever. But it, I got to tell you, it is – it's like it feels good to be with them still. I'm glad that I'm, that I'm still, like, with them – and and underwater with them and in the canoe with them it, it feels good yeah i'm excited to see where they'll go next yeah so we have quite a long question from mark and i'm just gonna read it all to you i wondered about sending this to you in an email but here we go so mark says you're a dashing rock and roll star who also has one of the best horror novels of the decade. Stacks of other work already written and a lady by your side who is not only drop dead gorgeous, but also an incredible artist. When do you plan on winning the lottery, achieving cold fusion and revealing to the world that you can also fly and turn invisible at will? Seriously, from the outside, life looks pretty good right now. Do you have a lot of pinch yourself moments or are you just enjoying the ride? Have you ever operated with any type of script or does your current success exceed any past plans or aspirations? Looking ahead, do you operate under any sort of business plan, long range or otherwise? If so, how and when was that formulated and how does it continue to evolve? Whew. So a lot to unpack there. 
Well, Mark, what city do you live in? Because let's get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's like drink like 15 drinks and talk about all these things man wow to um wow the front half of that was like like uh scary in a way like i pictured like while you're reading that i pictured like the camera cuts to the guy that he's talking about and that guy like in the gutter with like a needle in his arm or something, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's not going so well as it seems, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, jeez, uh, man. That's a lot of stuff. I will. Uh, wow. Mark. Wow. You really went for it with that one. Um, I will say uh, about the plans and exceeding the plans, that whole thing. Um, that's a hard one to say. And this is something I think we talked about before, Michael, which was that, you know, in when I started writing and, and I didn't know another, a single other writer um, in this area or any really. There's one dude I knew in Mississippi who had brilliant horror story ideas, but he didn't really write them down. And then, so I'm writing and I used to sort of, you know, interview myself, uh, pretend to talk to agents. Uh, I would, I would pretend that, you know, each book that I finished, uh, was on a shelf already. And I would like take it down from the shelf. And I would, I would, I would even like almost like have arguments with like an agent about a book that didn't, or like with an agent that didn't exist. It was like a strange sort of delusional, exciting and delusional world that I was like going through where I was just writing book after book after book with no intention of shopping them, not because I was so like noble and anti like, you know, establishment, but because I was in a band with my best friends touring the country and playing, you know, a different city a night. And it just felt good to write these books. And if that felt good enough. And so, you know, when Bird Box got picked up and all that really, really exciting stuff happened, it was almost like this delusion looked look, started to look more like a transparency and all the details and the shading and the colors were being like filled in as if this delusion slowly became reality or something. And I was arguing with an agent and I was pulling Bird Box off a shelf and I am talking about a house at the bottom of a lake now. And so to, to say, to, add, to, a, to say if it's like exceeding, you know, what you had in mind, that's, it's a hard thing to say because a lot of, a lot of us writers and maybe you included, um, Mark, um, we're like big dreamers and big thinkers and not just in like, oh, I'm going to have a bestseller, not in that way, but in a, I'm going to write the scariest fucking book that's ever been written, you know, that kind of way. And so, you know, to say, is it exceeding that? Well, I don't, you know, in, in a way, yeah, because it's, it's like, wow, this is really happening. Oh my God. And I'm not taking a moment of that for, uh, for granted, but in another way, well, isn't it this kind of exactly what you were, you know, pretending was happening before it was. And so in that way, I would say, no, it's not exceeding it. It's it, but it, it is definitely um, a mind screw either way, uh, a pleasant mind screw most of the time. And then in terms of, you know, the plans, like I do, I, I personally, you know, would love to be a book a year comes out kind of guy. And, you know, I'd even love a book every six months, you know, that kind of thing. And, but I understand that the publishing industry doesn't really, it, it doesn't work like it, 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 or it doesn't operate like it did in like the eighties and nineties and seventies where in, in, and this is the same thing true with bands where a guy would put out a book. Like, I mean, all these guys we know and girls putting out books like every six months. And we, that's like, so, sounds so thrilling right now. It's like, if one's a lemon, big deal, you're going to get another one in six months. And, you know, and the who and the Beatles and all, and all those bands are putting out an album every six months and the beach boys. And you really got to watch them like develop. And for a while I thought like, you know, that was much, a much better scenario than this one which is it seems like a guy puts out a book every couple of years at best or something. But for some reason, it seems to be working out. Like I am still getting to know these other authors as their work's coming out. I am still watching them grow. And here I am, Bird Box is the only thing I have out. And now a house at, a, at, a, at the bottom of a lake is coming out. And I feel like that feels like a, a great follow-up to Bird Box. Okay, well, it's a couple years later, but okay. And then another book with Harper Collins 
in six months from now. So, so the, there is, I do have like, like hopes in a career arc way, you know? And, but I think I also need to accept that the publishing industry moves slower than it did when we were all first falling in love with books, like in the eighties. And as to the first part of what you brought up, oh yeah, all I, all I, all I can say about, <laughs> that was crazy. Uh, all I can say about all that stuff is like, yeah, man, I would just love to get like completely hammered with you and talk about all that, you know, like, like, like Allison and, and the stack of, you know, sometimes that stack of, um, unpublished rough drafts is, you know, I want to be buried with them, you know, sometimes it's like, I couldn't be prouder there. They, they weigh as much as me and they're taller than me. And then other times I look at it and it's like horrifying. I'm like, Oh my God, when am I going to get these 26 stories out there? And it's overwhelming. And like, it's like teetering. It's like a pile of pages teetering on the edge of panic, you know? And I can just imagine them all just like being blown by some like freaked out wind or something. So yeah, it's a it's an awesome thing to to have. And as we were talking earlier, when you're feeling down, you're like, hey man, you, you got this body of work. But at other times, it's it's a little overwhelming. And as goes, and I know I don't have to address every single thing you said, but it's kind of fun right now. Um, and as goes, Allison, yes, she is as phenomenal as she, phenomenal as she seems online, and she is as pretty in person as she seems online, if not prettier. Um, and she's also hilarious and. Um, but yeah, you know, I, uh, I, I got the same panics and, and freak outs and self, you know, bouts of self-loathing and, and nights where I drank way too much and, and mornings where I'm like, oh, you know, the imposter syndrome where you feel like, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, that whole thing. Mm. Um, so I'd say like, it's a, I would say it's a healthy mix of both, you know, uh, loving it, um, uh, seeing it as reality, wondering what the hell is going on, seeing it as unreality, freaking out, loving it again. Yeah, and I think it is important to counterpoint it as you did with the times when perhaps being Josh Malaman isn't so great. So I'm, I'm wondering on that point, what are your biggest fears and worries? Yeah, one, one um, I th you know, I, 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 one time I saw Kristen, my agent, had posted online something... Something about, it was like an article about being careful about your, you know, writing, like your writing is your identity, that kind of thing. Um, and that, that article scared the piss out of me because I, it really struck me like, oh my gosh, like what would I, what would be my identity without writing, you know, just about every day in my life? What would be my identity, identity without this, without thinking about a house at the bottom of a lake without thinking of black mad wheel and bird box and all these things like what the heck would I like I don't even know what I would think of myself so and I understand because I'm a whatever a thinking man and because I've seen enough other you know stories of people who were fixed so fixated that they didn't you know didn't pay attention to the human inside themselves you know I understand that I probably need to address the fact that like hey, if you weren't writing, like, it's okay, you still exist, and you're still a good man, and you're still a good person, and all these things, and, but man, I would, I would say that would be my biggest fear, is to somehow not lose the, um, uh, publishing side of it, although that, that would suck, but, but the, the actual writing side of it, to lose that, like, even before, when Bob was talking about that year off that Peter Straub took, um, I like had like, I felt like the hairs on my arms start to stand. I'm like a year off, dude. Oh my God. I, I don't even know if I would recognize myself after a year off. And that kind of, and that scares you too. You're like, why? Like, I mean, is it your whole identity and what you're writing? Really? I mean, is it? And if so, like, then are you writing what you want to be writing? I mean, you can, man, that, that's a worm. That's a, uh, a, a downward spiral if you want to think too far into there. Right. So, so I would say that's, that's probably the thing that scares me the most. Also, just like, the reg, you know, same as you, like the happiness of the people I love. And that, that, you know, those are my biggest concerns. You know, I worry about my brothers, my mom, Allison, um, my dad and, and writing and whether or not I'm leaning a little bit too much on like, like I'm some bizarre character that writes a lot. And like, who am I really? Those kind of like I, that, those moments scare the shit out of me. Mm. What do you think? Are there any misconceptions that others might have when you introduce yourself and you introduce yourself 
as a writer or a musician? Um, you know, I remember um, one time Mark Owen, um, I think there's a famous like English Mark Owen, isn't there or something? But I think there is. But I, I think Mark I think there's one who was in the boy band Take That. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. Yep, that's it. But Mark Owen happens to be one of my, my lifetime best friends, yeah. but a different Mark. And um, he one time said, you know, we were on the road and our songs were very like positive. I, I say they're so positive. It's not like we're like, you know, a workout band or something. But but they're whatever. They're bright and poppy. And he and he said that, man, if you put a, a patch cord up to my brain, it'd be like death metal. But for some reason, we come out, you and I write all these like really bright songs together. And I'm like, I know, man, I don't know what that is. So sometimes I do, I do feel like you only get like, like, um, uh, like, at a, let's say you're on a panel, right, at a horror convention or something, and you only get, you know, a few comments or something about this or that, and then you're like, if if you made everyone laugh or something, you know, then it's like, oh, I'm just gonna think you're like this real fun, funny guy, and maybe you are, but obviously we're all so much more layered than that. Uh, this podcast, I think that we've reached sort of a awesome philosophical zone <laughs> um, that I'm really kind of happy that we reached right now. And I think that if someone were to listen to this, this episode, I, it would be, it would be hard for me at this point to say like, I was, I, I didn't represent myself or something. Cause I mean, I've been a motor mouth for three hours, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, this is what we tried to do with the, the Sasara podcast. It's very much the, long form interview and a slow burn and yeah look looking at the writing but also going that little bit deeper and looking at the person so hopefully we're yeah. doing that <laughs> yes i think we are doing that yep we're getting yeah, you know, into think, the I zen think, part of the show now we have we have it are we tripping <laughs> 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 little mojo rising <laughs> awesome Whew. <laughs> See, that's it when you kind of wake up and you realize your whole life as you thought it was was just one big trip oh my god oh my god i'm still on a couch i'm still on a couch in college right yeah. now well the, re the real you <laughs> is actually someone who you think is one of your friends someone on facebook for example oh. that's actually Whoa. you you could be paul tremblay this is an extended Paul Tremblay trip happening right this second. <laughs> I just met him, actually. Uh, I went out to Boston for a, um, at, the, at the Merrimack Valley Book Festival. I can't remember the exact proper name for it. They're Christopher Golden, who I love, love that guy. Um, I've seen pictures from that. You were there with uh, Christopher Golden, Paul yeah. Tremblay, Brecken McLeod was there. Yeah. Uh, yep. I mean, I, I loved, I loved that. Y'all need to post more pictures of that kind of stuff because I, I live vicariously through those pictures. It I'm too was, busy to go to those things. I'm just like, oh, I want to be there. <laughs> it was a great time, and then, but Paul Tremblay had, um, whatever, uh, family like a death in the family, so um, he wasn't able to come to the festival part. But then later in the night, um, he came to the. Uh, the party part, the dinner, drinks, like, part, whatever, like, later. And the night really ended with him and I in a booth or a table, but in, a, in the corner of this bar in Massachusetts talking about, you know, kind of, like, what stuff we're talking about right now and books and the speed at which we want things to come out and the speed at which we don't and other authors. And it was really... And I wrote him, the, you know, we, we wrote each other the next day a little bit, but I, I wrote him the what I'm about to say now, which was it was refreshing for me to talk to you know another author who particularly i think is actually going through similar things that i am i, I feel like for some reason and we talked about this too bird box and a head full of ghosts are, are somehow linked where we see them together often in articles and and in uh you know people like people will recommend on twitter like oh read uh bird box and a head full of ghosts it's almost they have they are not similar in any way but for somehow the two of those seem seem linked in some way or something. And him and I were talking about that and, and other stuff. It was cool because, you know, around here, uh, you know, Kathy Koja, who is brilliant. I mean, my God, what a wonderful 
uh, writer to have in town. She is one of my all-time favorites. And John Skip, all the way from L.A., has really, really, really helped in terms of, you know, just meeting him and talking to him about things and careers and industry and all that and just writing. And but I don't really have that many writers around to like bounce the stuff off, and so it was good for me to hang out with him that night. It was it was like good for my uh, for the big picture or something in my mind. You know what I mean? You met a kindred spirit. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I think him and I, but, him and I, could have used many more nights like that, and maybe we'll get them. And I keep on, and I always forget that you and live pretty probably pretty close to Kathy Kocha. Like so, like and two it, miles if away. I lived where you lived. I'd be like, "Hey, no, I, I have another I question." Know, man. <laughs> I know, I know. We're all we're all going to um, her uh, nerve theater is putting on a performance in January, and we're all going to go see it. I meet up with her, you know, now and again uh, for coffee, and we write each other. And man, she is as good as it gets, and. She's brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. So I know. I've talked, I've talked with a little bit with her a little bit on social media. She's real sweet, uh, and she's one of my favorites too. Just yeah, like I said, man. if I lived closer, <laughs> I'd be bugging her a lot. I have more questions. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I know. And then you know who else is from around here is Thomas Legati. Oh wow! Yeah, he's from um, like I mean, again, like like four miles from where I grew up, like Thomas Ligotti lived and was working at, it, this is bizarre, our band played at a, um, uh, a, like, event put on by this place called Gale Publishing, and Gale Publishing does, like, reference books and whatever, and Tom Thomas Ligotti worked at Gale, for Gale Publishing. So, wow. like, like we're, so I'm, like, you know, with my band, and they're telling, and then the people, I think he had just left there or something, and the people that work there we're like, oh, you write scary stories. Do you know Thomas Ligotti? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, he worked here too. I was like, wait, what? What are you talking? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that yeah, he's from like this area, like the same like suburb that I am. So those he's are very, two- he's very he's uh, very it's there's very little known about him. So I you know. just no. you know, which I mean that's on purpose, but you know, yeah, uh, no doubt. his they, work they, is phenomenal. <laughs> phenomenal, yeah. So. Those are two pretty good ones to have, like to be, to be, to be. But I don't ever talk to him. But to, those are pretty two awesome, awesome ones to have from around here. You know, that's cool. But again, um, you know, the, those man, those New Englanders, holy cow, they got so many of them out there. You know, like I couldn't believe it. Everyone I talked to at that festival was, I'm like, where are you from? Oh, like thirty minutes away. Oh, twenty. Oh, I live right down the street. Oh, two hours away. You know, like everyone there is from that area. And meeting all these writers. And I was just like, wow, you guys all have each other all the time. I am like a I'm like a total isolated freak out there in Michigan, you know? <laughs> well she'd be be where I'm at, man. I'm at the, the southern tip of the United States almost, you know. Whoa. Are you in like the keys? No, I'm in I'm in Texas. Uh, oh, you're in Texas, right at the Texas Louisiana border, at the bottom of the Texas Louisiana border. Holy so, cow! Yeah, I can go. I can go further south. We can go all the way down into you know Mexico. Uh, don't want to go there, but uh, I, I'd probably like to visit it one day. You know, Texas is so big; you can drive eight eight hundred miles east. You cross five states. You go eight hundred oh, miles west. You're still in Texas. That's where <laughs> I'm at. <laughs> uh, where, what um what city? Uh, I'm in Nederland, Texas. Okay, so we I don't know how close that is to Austin, but my band we just played at South by Southwest. We were there, you know, in March. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, I was in, in April. I was in San Antonio at the San Antonio uh, Book Fest with uh, Max Booth. Oh so. man, I did that. I did that last year. He said that you might try to show up this year. He told me that. And then on the day I sh- arrived at his house, uh, we were talking about who's going to be there. And he says, I don't think Josh is going to be here. And I was like, oh, man, that would have been cool. But oh, well. <laughs> oh, man, we loved that. Did you go to the um, – there was like at that San Antonio Book Fest, there was that um, that like – I don't know what you call it. It was at the theater, though, where like authors – like there was like a uh, – they read stories and people like voted for which one they liked the best or something. Did you go to that thing? We didn't. We didn't make it there in time. Uh, we you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, 
And we went to the little the book barn, basically that Barnes and Noble had set up to get signed copies of books. But you know, we 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 had to set up. Uh, we were late getting there. We had to set up. Uh, I was intent on selling my book, and Max was intent on selling his books. I had some friends show up. Uh, I mean, like Matt Bocelli showed up, and then I had some personal friends who live in Austin showed up, or actually near uh, you know, near that area, and they actually drove in just to see me, who I haven't seen probably in a couple years. And uh, and let's see who else was there. Joe McKinney was there. He came by for a little while. Very very cool. He's uh, from there. Oh yeah, he yeah. He, it's like right. gee, I just live down the road, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, and when we go into the little book barn and everything, I was wanting to meet Whitley Striver. And, uh, and of course, you know, uh, ask, I said, Hey, are any of the writers still here? And they're like, no, you had to be at the event in the morning. I was, and the guy said it so snobbily. I was like, oh, I'm just going to buy these books and leave, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, uh, and, uh, you know, but yeah, yes. I wanted to meet him, but I, I didn't realize what kind of schedule it was. So, yeah. Yeah. But it was yep. a lot of fun. It was a Get lot of fun. Get him on here. Get him on. This is horror on the podcast, man. You should you can wait, get Willie Striver on here. That'd be cool. Oh, he's a trip. Uh, yeah, I imagine so. And, and I'm going. Well, I'm going to read the. I'm going to read Wolfen. Thank, thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there anything you can tell us about Black Mad Wheel? Yeah. Um. Wow. Black Mad Wheel. Wow. That one. Um. It comes out in May. I think I may have once told you what it was about but maybe it was in an email essentially it's about um members of like the army band um uh after the war they start like a rock band and so they're they're like great friends they're all best friends and they're in like a band together and they were in the army band and, and then they're they're sent out to um the namib desert in africa to locate the source of a very scary sound and the you know the army pretty much was like, hey, you guys, you musician soldiers, like, tell us what the fuck is making this sound. And the bandmates are flown out there and left to left to find it. So if you can picture, um, you know, soldier musicians walking around with boom mics instead of instead of guns, uh, that would give you sort of like the the start of it. That's all I'll tell you about it now. But it's uh, I love it. I absolutely you know I love the book. Um, it comes out in May. The process was pretty intense. I had a I had a new editor on this one, and he uh you know what he edited is the Ruins by Scott Smith, which I love that book. Mm. Um, his name is Zach Wagman, and the cover art I keep wanting to reveal it. I have it, but um, it's not like it's not quite time to do that. You know, you know, you know what it's like to have like a cover on you that you want to show everyone, but it's not the right time yet. Right, so I'm waiting yeah. for yeah. that. And, um, and that's, yeah, that's about it for now. That's, that's about, I guess, all I can tell you about it. Black Mad Wheel. Sounds, sounds like a, like a song title, because it is. It was the a song title of a High Strung song um, that came out on an album in, like, 2010 or 2011 or something. And when I was, when I was figuring out the title of this book, um, it kept coming back to Something Wheel, Something Wheel. And finally, I'm like, hey, why don't you just use a High Strung song title? That's that that's kind of cool, so so that's what I did. So in Black Mad Wheel, that's the name. That sounds like a book that I'm definitely going to have to review. I'm not going to let my team do it. So <laughs> I'm sorry. <All> right. <laughs> I, I love it. I love the idea. I can't wait. Oh man, awesome, sweet. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to get you back on nearer the time and you know dig deeper into it. I think the way we're going, we may just talk until it comes out. Yeah, yeah. That, that sounds about right for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I don't know if I can say this on the air, but you did show me the cover, and it is yeah. absolutely yep. fantastic. And I mean, I, like, all of your cousins, covers so far have been... They've just got a lot of attitude, a lot of depth to them, and they they just work. Yeah, you know what? It's fine. The Black Man Wheel one sort of reminds me of uh, House at the Bottom of a Lake. Not not in composition or not in color, mm. but it just in terms of their, it does seem like there's a depth to it. 
Whereas the uh, the bird box, the the hardcover bird box, which I absolutely love, is I don't remember who asked that question before. I wish I could remember that right now. It was the first question, the black and white question. Uh, um, let's have a look. Um, that that original cover was like black and white, and I was like, oh my god, this is like perfect for this. Yeah, but, it was but e Eric Sparkman like, asked, didn't he? Yeah, yep, that Eric, was it. Yeah, yep, Eric. Hi, Eric. Again, if you're <laughs> still. Yeah, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Eric. <laughs> That's funny. Can can I keep that bit in about having seen yeah. the cover? I, yep. I don't know. Or uh, Harper Collins is going to be like, what the fuck? What are you doing, Josh? Don't send oh. that to anyone. <laughs> My God, Allison just walked into the room that I'm in, and I was like looking down, and I looked up, and suddenly she's standing in here, and I like just jumped. <laughs> and she goes, uh, she goes, really? Like, I really? I just scared you? <laughs> <laughs> well like one one thing that i enjoy from your social media feed is like you can tell that you and allison must have so much fun together in terms of just playing horror pranks on yourself and on the neighbors i think one that i saw recently hadn't allison put like a realistic doll or something in a car oh, on the driveway oh, and then like, I don't remember. oh my god that uh, yeah. one <laughs> I don't even remember why L let me just give you a couple of the Allison pranks on me and and by the way they really they work every time um but this one yeah it was it, it was a mannequin I don't remember why it was in the car you oh you brought it to a photo shoot or something so she had it with her to go to a photo shoot this one wasn't necessarily a prank but she just she had left it in the car after and then I went outside to have a cigarette <laughs> Get away! And then that was. <laughs> who was that? What was that? What was that? You'll never know. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, hey, will you scream for them? I can. Okay, okay, she's gonna go practice, I guess. Wow, you're gonna practice screaming. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, we're just so gonna I went hear there. this distant scream now. <laughs> <laughs> What's that in the background? Oh, just screaming practice. <laughs> Oh, that was crazy. Did you guys hear that? I did, I did. I, I did, like too. Spiked the meters or something, man. Holy cow. I feel like I feel like I have to like go to the hospital or something. It helped that there was a microphone. <laughs> that, so anyway. That scream was definitely what I call a, the Jennifer Carpenter factor. I don't know <laughs> if you've ever seen uh, the, uh, what is it, Exorcism of uh, Emily Rose that she yep. was in. But uh, her screams, like, win. They're, they're the best. Uh, and so I, I kind of gauge anytime somebody screams in a movie, anytime a, a woman screams in a movie, I, it's the Jennifer Carpenter factor. You have to be able to beat that scream. That scream was there. Man, we, we, Allison would do that in each of the Bird Box readings. There was a moment, you know, where Mallory screams, and Allison would do that. And one bookstore in, I think, Kentucky had, had got wind of the fact that you know the author coming in there's there's a girl that's gonna release like a blood curdling scream in your bookstore i just want you to be prepared for that so they approached us when we walked in and they're like um so we heard um that you know <laughs> one of you is going to like just suddenly like scream bloody murder and you know there are people like in the in the cafe and and we were like okay okay and then like um you know of course i turned to alice and i'm like you have you have to do it you have to do it. just do it go for it just <laughs> Go, give it your all, like, don't worry, like, come on, let's just go. And she did. It was great. It was great. <laughs> um, yeah, no, yeah, she, um, she's got me good. You want, you want to hear a good prank? I'll just tell you one. So we had forever, we had a, a penguin suit on our, on our front porch, just sitting there forever, like for months. And I was at a pool tournament, which I won, by the way. And I came back. And I was so excited, you know, and I'm like, and it's the winter time, and I'm like trotting up the steps on the front porch, and that fucking penguin stood up, and I like dropped the like the 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 sheet of paper that said I won, and I like leapt back. I mean, that penguin was inert for six months, and then it just stood up, and it was Allison wearing this penguin suit and like <laughs> waiting for me for who knows how long in the winter, you know? <laughs> just, That's was, crazy. <laughs> no hint of it, man. I lost it. I was like, oh my God. You know, and we like, 
you know, I mean, my mind's in the in the supernatural clouds all day anyway. So, you know, to me, I was like, it's happening. Everything is happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's all real. <laughs> it's all real. This isn't a dream. It's like your Rosemary's Baby moment. <laughs> this is no dream. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, before we go... What advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? Hmm. <laughs> um, wow. Well, between ages like 19, yeah, like 18 and 29 or something, I, I had started and not finished five novels. And to me, that's the only failure is not finishing. Um, if you write a lemon, you write a lemon, but who cares? You wrote a fucking book. It's, and that is a success to me. It can be the worst thing. Who cares? Boringest thing. Doesn't matter. And I think I would tell my 18-year-old self, who, who, when I think about it, like, he did a lot. He was doing a lot right in terms of what he was in love with and what he was, like, you know, excited about. But I also think, that, and justifiably so, when you're only 18, I think my 18-year-old self probably was, like, you know, you know, hanging out with his friends, like, all, like you, you could have worked in you could have finished these books with these like small little small little tricks or whatever. And and I, I I would give I would tell him one of those tricks is never to worry if what you're working on is good or bad. To get rid of the words good or bad. And I don't mean to sound like the like Tony Robbins of horror literature or something, but if you could just get rid of like literally the words good or bad you do not exist in the rough draft stage. I think that my 18-year-old self and for the next 10 years would have finish those five novels they still haunt me a little bit and i i should be okay with all that because of all the writing that's happened since then but every now and then i'll be like man what if you had finished those books what would they have been like and what would they have been about you know and one of them made it 300 pages man and i didn't finish it 300 i mean at that point all you got to do is write the end <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> i don't care what scene you're on just write the end yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so I, that's where I would start is like not not necessarily go easier on yourself, but you know I think that at eighteen I was so like like naturally afraid of so many things. Like you know I think it's very easy to think like the voice on your radio is a deity. The 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 names on the books in the bookstore are are they're made of different stuff than you. Um, you know, the band you see on stage are like have descended from Mount Olympus with song, you know, and I think that and, and girls were horrifying. I mean, come on, Jesus, my God. And so I would give myself the 18 year old self. I would have my 18 year old self read at least the beginning of A House at the Bottom of a Lake and just see how James just walked right up to right up to Amelia and asked her on a date without knowing her that well. And, and not only just a date, a weird date. You know, that's the kind of advice I'd be like, you know, like not go easy on yourself. But how about let's get rid of the words, the, the words, good or bad. And let's just see what happens from there. I think that's great advice. Yeah, it's kind of like that advice to give yourself permission to screw up. Yeah. In, in a way, I mean, it's to me, I don't like that advice because it, 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 it invites, you know, just to me, it's like, well, eventually it's like you can just write. I wrote three pages of crap. Just the word crap, all crap, period, crap, period, crap, period. I gave myself, you know, permission to screw up. And I've wasted, you know, a month of my time. <laughs> so, I mean, you got to you gotta strive to be better. You can't just, you know, go ahead and go, I'm going to be bad every time I write, you know. It, it's There's a happy medium, but you have to give your, you can't beat yourself up if you don't, if it's not perfect in your mind, because it's, it's never going to be perfect. You never achieve that level. I don't think that the spirit of the advice is really saying, you know, to purposefully be crap, not to <laughs> just literally write crap. I think the spirit is saying, you know, strive for the best, give it your all, but be okay with the fact that you might fail. Right. I, I like that phrase better. Be okay with it. Yeah. Don't, it's not like a permission, but just be okay with it. Yeah. One cool one cool way that that crap story would work is if one of your characters got stuck on repeat. <laughs> That's true. That's another story idea right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then 
then if you just kind of squeeze that into the beginning of that whole like m- month long of writing the word crap, then it kind of works. And then you wrote then you wrote kind of a meta masterpiece. <laughs> Johnny was in the middle of a sentence <laughs> when he got stuck on repeat. I don't give a crap, 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 yeah. crap. <laughs> And I think I knew he was gonna do that. I was like, here it comes. <laughs> I think part of the art of that piece is, of course, you know, you could say in kind of interviews about it, you know, there was no copy and pasting. You literally were there every workday for a month. Crap, crap, crap. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's why people are are buying it. They're buying it for that craftsmanship. <laughs> you know We're what? Legit that. Because Jack, because J- all work and no play makes Jack a dope boy was already taken. Right, right, <laughs> right. Uh, <it's> crap. <laughs> I I I just spoke at a university here. A friend of mine is a teacher there, and afterwards there was an eighteen year old who was asking me questions. And I, your last question, just whatever, just reminded me that I actually did have some advice for him, which was like, man, you could, you know, fail at what you want to do or, or even get into the wrong, like you could get into the like a line of work that you don't, that isn't even right for you. You, you could have all these wrong turns for the next like 20 years and you'd still be younger than where I am now. And you would then be the age I was when Bird Box came out. And we're all young right now, you know, like the three of us are young right now. And it's like, I, I do think it's not a matter of like telling someone like, hey, you have time wasted. But it is like, again, it's yeah, it, it really all comes down to go easy on yourself, doesn't it? Like, do, like try your hardest, do what you want to do, but like fucking go easy on yourself. Right, exactly. Definitely. And this is something that comes up again and again, because and it, this could be linked to depression and anxiety with within the creative community because normally our harshest critic is ourself or your girlfriend no right. I'm just kidding yeah definitely oh you're gonna get a scare later now <laughs> oh man man it's coming before you go, where can our listeners connect with you? I, you know, it's, man, it's still the same thing it's been, which is just Facebook, which is just Josh Mallerman and the author page and my own, my personal page too. Um, and Twitter, man, I'm not good at it, but I'm on there. Um, and, you know, I am kind of active on Instagram. So, and all it is is Josh Mallerman in all these places. And I don't think there's another, I don't think there's another Josh Mallerman. So, Unless there is. Hmm. <laughs> and if there, if there is, if you find him, well, he might disappear. <laughs> I might smother him. <laughs> it's another story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, what if you, like, kept smothering the other Josh Malaman and then he keeps, like, kind of self-replicating? He's bigger well, every mean, time. You wanna, you wanna the prestige. End Right, right. I want to end this interview on a weird note. Um, <laughs> I am working on a, a short story called Jessica Mallerman, where where I meet the me that had I been born a, a girl. You know how your parents are like, oh, if you were born a girl, you, we would have named you Jessica. Well, I meet her in this in this story because we have like similar interests, and I end up following her back to her house, and I see how her parents are like, or, which are my parents. Are like are like a little different to her, like very different to her. She's a girl and all this, whatever. It's called Jessica Mallerman, and it ends up getting kind of kind of freaky. Not like you know, it does get freaky though, scary. And right, right. so, I think a great <laughs> freaky way to end this podcast is to tell you that I am writing a story about running into my woman self. <laughs> there you go. All right. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween, everyone. Michael, thank you so much for all the the work and getting Pi to do the cover and the edit notes were so not just really good, but they were also really like funny, some of them, the things right. that you wrote. Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well I try and, and keep it light. <laughs> it was it was a really great experience and I, you know, I I wanna do another <laughs> another and another and I just just thank you, man. This is like 
you know, it's a huge day for me. I got, you know, a, a book coming out in, in, in two days, thanks to you guys. So On Halloween. It's awesome. On Halloween, man. On Halloween. Yeah, thank you so much. I, In the event that you ever run into someone in your life who is ungrateful, I am not like that person. <laughs> Fantastic. I am extremely grateful. <laughs> no, I appreciate that, and I'm really happy to have worked with you on this. It's been a lot of fun, and I think we're going to get a lot of success out of it hell whatever happens it's already a success it's an awesome story coming out at halloween with an awesome cover. yeah yeah i totally agree halloween. all right <laughs> that was a great combination <laughs> there you go night <laughs> All right, hope you enjoyed the Halloween podcast with Josh Malaman. Do continue listening after the credits because Alison was kind enough to perform Amelia's song below. As it is Halloween, we decided to put the interview out in its entirety. We normally only run for about an hour or so as listeners in the past have told me that's what they like consumable hour sized chunks but what do you think i mean how did you find that would you just prefer us to put the interview out in its entirety if you want to support the podcast and i would love it if you did so because it does take quite a bit of time every week to get this together you can support us on patreon and you can pledge just one dollar. You'll get all of the interviews early. There are other levels as well, which will include free ebooks and t shirts. So head on over, have a look, see what you think. www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. If you've got the financial means and you can support us, I'd be hugely appreciative. I want to keep the show running. I want it. Ideally, if we can afford to do so, I'd love I'd love to keep this going forever. It's a lot of fun interviewing people each week and dissecting writing processes, really exploring what it is to write horror. And speaking of which, we've got a Writer's Craft Talk episode coming up in the next month or so, looking at techniques for creating suspense that was voted on by you via twitter so that will be 20 writers talking about suspense and fiction we're also going to be inviting te growl back on the show to talk about november's this is horror novella they don't come home anymore but remember right now halloween it's all about a house at the bottom of a lake. And it's out today. Ebook and physical edition. And I would urge you to order it before Monday, November the 7th. Because when you do that and you send proof of purchase to Michael at thisishorror.co.uk, I'll send you the audiobook free of charge. And this may be the only way that you can get the audiobook for free. So... It's a good offer. Take advantage of it. Please do. All right. Until next time, take care of yourself. Look after one another. Read horror and have a great, great day. All right. So here's Alison Lago performing Below. Unknown to the house in the deep blue, breathing deep the last time before we grow.